Welcome to another special Table Read Tuesday. Today we're reading the unproduced blacklist script proposed by one of our regulars, Asterisk Weird, and our great actors that aren't weird, unless you take that as a badge of honor, as I do, like I prefer to be weird rather than normal. So um, that's how I take it. But we have Vicki Dykes. Good evening, everyone. I'm Vicki Dykes. I'm from Central Alberta. I'm an actress, and tonight I will be reading for Professor Palmer. Oh, wonderful. And we have Angel Peterson. Hello, I'm Angel Peterson, and I will be um, action descriptions at some point. All right, thank you for that. We always appreciate that so much. And we have Erin Lillis. Yeah, hello, I'm Erin Lillis, voice actress, and tonight I am playing Eric Ron, Michelle, and Daniel. Wonderful. And Roger Anthony. Hi, I'm Roger Anthony. I'm an actor between Atlanta and New York, and I'm reading Carl. Thank you, Carl. And Heather Lee Cameron. Hello, my name is Heather Lee Cameron. I'm an actor, I'm a writer, I'm an independent filmmaker, and I'm a family history research student from Lethbridge, Alberta. Tonight, I'll be playing Ben, and I am personally on the autism spectrum, so this is a very good role for me. I hope I can play a neurodivergent character as much as I live it in real life. <laughs> I'm sure you'll do amazing as you always do. Representation matters. <laughs> We're trying to do as much as we can here with that, and we all agree. So thank you. Uh, Ashaki. Hi, I am Ashaki Ayoka. I am a podcast host, voice actor, writer, and engineer. Tonight, I will be playing Mary, Grandpa, and Gabe. All right. Awesome. I don't want to stop our flow, but I forgot last time I asked you what type of engineer, because there's so oh. many different types, electrical, mechanical, this, that, that. So I do a software engineering. Software engineering. All right. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And next, we have Petra Stedman. Hi, Petra Stedman, uh, writer, actress, and a full-time reader. So I got really into reading Blacklist scripts, and I saw this one, and I was like, it just seems like something our talented stable of, of actors would probably just love to sink their teeth into, <laughs> especially with it focusing on a topic that is a little unusual. You have a neurodivergent main character, and it is all about how they see the world, which is kind of cool to be able to literally show a different viewpoint, which I thought was very interesting and worthy of notice and bringing out. So I hope uh, everybody likes it. If you hate your casting, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I was just reading it and going like, this person I really saw is this person, this person I really saw is that actor and character. So hopefully, and I do go ahead and sign the role of Becca just because this girl is, I swear somebody was taking notes on me or something <laughs> for criticisms. I'm like, who was watching and taking down notes on the things that I say and do? We'll be fine. We'll be fine. We'll be happy. We'll be grateful. Yeah, just, yeah, don't worry. Chill. Okay. We oh, love you. Yeah, thank you so much for suggesting this one and sending the script, Petra, and all the casting work. We really, really appreciate it. So thank you. We love you. Um, thank you for casting. Yes. You're and as you were mentioning, Petra, being able to see it from their perspective, Heather, that's why you said you put the, the gray as your background, correct? Part of yes, the... because sometimes being on the spectrum in the face of such a vibrant, beautiful world can be very lonely. It's like being on an island all by yourself. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that and bringing that. And you're gonna, I'm sure that's going to, you're bringing it to the character as well. And I hope so. Uh, uh, I'm Jacob Patrick, and I'll be reading Kretha, Polka Dot, and Demon. And last, we have Roxane Armstrong. I'm Roxane Armstrong. <laughs> uh, tonight, I'm going to be reading Emma and Mike, and I'm an actor in Central Alberta. Sweet. All right. So that is our wonderful cast for tonight. And I will share the script so that we can read. And there may be a little interruption later. 
Um, we have intermission today, currently scheduled for page 56. All right. We asterisk, weird. Written by Augustus Schiff. 10, 8, 21. Ooh, lots of writing. Interior, hospital waiting room day. Ben, 19, meek, very much on the spectrum. Sits in the waiting room, headphones over his ears, going through a music app on his phone. The normal sounds of the hospital are muted through his headphones. He looks up, sees a doctor and nurse speaking quietly in the corner. Then a cancer patient walking around their hallways with help from a nurse. The nurse is working at their station. He hits play, a weird offbeat, but fun song, perhaps something for your mind by super orgasm. For the first moments of the song, everything remains normal, but soon enough, Ben starts to see everyone dancing. Subtly at first, the cancer patient taking steps to the beat, nurses at the station, moving papers and typing in time, the doctor nurse duo swaying back and forth, but quickly evolves into a more complex dance, interpretive, chaotic, but still melodious, melodious ah, and beautiful. Each of their three groups Ben's watching, moving, and dancing in their own ways. The heightened dance reality continues until Ben's grandpa knocks his headphones off, as lovingly as one could knock off headphones, and everything's back to normal. She's ready for you. Interior Mary's hospital room day. Mary, Ben's mom, a cancer-stricken woman in her 50s, lies in a bed hooked up to an IV and a heart monitor with a large blanket. She sees Ben and smiles weakly beckoning him over. Ben walks over, various emotions flashing across his face, like he's unsure how to express himself. I was listening to a good song. Yeah, I got one for you, here. Ben hands his mother the phone and she starts to play It Makes No Difference Now by Ray Charles. The EKG sinks up to the beat of the song. They listen to the song, Ben smiles initially, but at the 30-second mark, I'll get along without you now. It's plain to see. Ben shuts off the song, a quick passing pain in his eyes. Not as good. Here, listen. Something for your mind picks up again. It's no Ray Charles, but I understand. <laughs> ben laughs, then leans over to hug his mother. As the song plays, she caresses him. The song continues over. Exterior graveyard day, a very bright and sunny day for Mary's funeral. Ben shifts uncomfortably in his clothes, headphones on, a song still playing as the officiant speaks. Various funerary proceedings happen in time with the music. The shutting of the Bible, lowering the mother, mourners offering condolences. Ben just stands there the whole time, nearly dead to the world. A few tears sneak through. Interior, exterior, Grandpa's Car University of Chicago Campus Day. Ben's still listening to the song. Hey. The song ends. Ben hits repeat. But before it kicks in, Grandpa knocks the headphones off again. The car is near the front steps of the dorm building on an otherwise normal day. Grandpa's driving. You can still change your mind. Take another few months. Start in the winter or next year when you're ready. I'm ready now. Grandpa sighs. My grades were good. I know you're smart, Ben. Everyone does. But college isn't just about grades. What about connection? I'm not going to be a politician. Not, I mean, people you can be around and actually enjoy it. Friends, a confidant, a girl. I didn't need those before. You had your mom before. A very uncomfortable pause. Grandpa tries to salvage it. Ben, I love you. You need more time to process. I'm going. Ben exits the car. Interior dorm hall for eight day. Michelle, the RA, leads Ben, rolling his luggage down the hallway. And this is your room right here, 812. It's a single, so congrats on that. And you've got your ID and everything. Ben nods. Great. Laundry in the basement, communal kitchen downstairs, dining hall across the street. A lot of us like to hang out in the lounge, but don't feel pressured if it's not your thing. And if you have an emergency or whatever, my door's always open. Metaphorically, just knock. 
You get it. Yes. Interior of Ben's room day. Ben unpacks clothes into the dresser, computer on the desk, large speakers next to the desk, school books on the shelves, noticeably no posters or other sort of decorations. Suck my giant purple dick! Woo! Carl, 19, brash but charismatic, will show up later. Exterior dorm hallway day. Ben sticks his head out the door to see who yelled that, but only to see Eric and Gabe. They'll show up soon too walking into a room down the hall, laughing with each other. Interior academic advisor's office the next day. Ben sits with Ron, 50s, a little fat, good heart, who reads over Ben's transcript on his computer. Ah, uh, looks like you filled a lot of core requirements with your community college classes and APs. Uh, that's good, that's good. Uh, do you know your major? No. Anything stuck out during community college? And uh, why, if you don't mind... Did you go there, by the way? Your grades are fine, and I see here you're on scholarship. My mom was dying of cancer. Fighting cancer. Oh, God, that's horrible. Is she okay? No. Oh, oh God, still going through chemo? She died. Oh, God, well, I'd shoot myself in the foot if I didn't put in a pitch for anthropology. That's what I studied near East Specialization. Uh, best decision I ever made. Ben notices the room is filled with books on the... Bazantes and Ottomans. No. You know what you don't like, at least. <laughs> but you've still got a few weeks to finalize classes. So for now, let's put you in a few across the board. A uh, little physical science, a little history, a little English. See what you like, what you maybe grow to like. Growth's a big part of college, you know. Ben nods. Let me print you a book list. Exterior quad day. Ben walks across the quad where a club, a club fair is taking place. Lots of people, lots of yelling. Ben's uncomfortable. One girl, Rebecca, 20, big glasses, almost capable of hiding her intelligence, wears a little leather bracelet, makes eye contact with Ben. Hey, join the club. We are not a cult. Mike, 20s, an ironic but lovable douche. And I can't hear Mike if he's trying to speak. You said cult for, oh, we're a little, we're a little bit of a cult. <laughs> ben, unsure of what to do, hurries off, slipping on his headphones. Rebecca slaps Mike on the shoulder. Would you stop scaring everyone away? You said cult first. Exterior seminary co-op bookstore day. Ben notices a student walking out with their hands filled with books, then walks into the lovely, heavily windowed bookstore. In Terry Seminary Co-op Bookstore Day, Ben walks through the basement where the class catalogs are stored, stacking an ever-growing pile of books in his arms. First floor, Ben exits the stairs, too concerned with his own world to see Professor Adam Palmer, 60s, very smart, over everything. They collide. Ben spills his books. Oh, Christ. Every year. Honestly, every goddamn year. Professor Palmer sees Ben cleaning up his books, Bends down to help with that, an unnecessarily loud groan. Thank you. I bet you're a first year too. Uh, you're a first year, right? I'm not going to kill you just for bumping into me. What is this, 11th century Bavaria? If you took my class, you'd get that joke. I'm a sophomore. A second year? Well, then you are in trouble. I transferred. Joke again. Oh, bad delivery, I know. Oh, welcome to you, Chicago. Little tip slash apology. You don't need those books. It's a scam. Get the PDFs online. Ben looks down at the books, then over to the cash register. He turns one of the textbooks around and sees the price $240, and then gently puts the entire stack on the ground and walks away. Interior Ben's room evening. Ben finishes illegally, downloading the last of his required textbooks for class. He plugs his phone into his speakers, scrolls through a playlist called Mom Songs, but doesn't play a song. His stomach growls light, growls oh, light. Oh, right. Oh, right. Interior, interior dining hall night. Ben, plate full of food, finds a table to sit at alone. At a table nearby sits Carl, the off-screen voice from before, Emma, 20, a big picture person, very little capacity for shame. Eric, 19, always stoned, still extremely intelligent, 
having a very loud conversation. Bruh, you cannot just say Plato and supported eugenics and then not follow it up. Evidence-based argument. Number one, bruh, find some better slang. Number two, have you read The Republic? Philosopher King? Strict class system. Did you skip the part about the class designation happening during childhood, not at birth? Yes, but any system like that would obviously end up encouraging eugenics. I'm sorry, what's that? Sounds like someone's coming to an independent conclusion not supported in the text. What's, what's that called again? Not being trapped by details? Or is it putting words in Plato's mouth? Oh, oh, and, and oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Fucking being wrong. Fuck you. Try it. Carl and Eric high five. Kritha. Anyone know how to pronounce that name? Kritha? Kritha? Kritha. Say that again. Sorry. Kritha. I can't hear that. Well, Kritha. Uh, 19, mm -hmm. small, steady, in metaphorical sense. And Gabe, 20, destined to be a center-right politician from a suburban district. Who is Creepy? I'm looking at the script. It you are. <laughs> I am. What? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you understand it's not how like it's on your screen are? or anything? <laughs> I don't read that. I can't read, obviously. Okay. <laughs> do you understand how great it is to be right? Seriously, don't make me disavow our friendship in 10 years. Yes, my black mile photos will come in handy, Mr. Future Representative. Mr. Future Speaker, and you wouldn't dare. What is it again? You want a law passed allowing monkey pets at a federal level? I want a law passed allowing me specifically to have a pet monkey. No one else. Oh, well, that's not my problem at all. Let me call it my high school ex's dad. Don't tease me. She throws a pee at Gabe. Gabe mocks a fence. Emma gives him a friendly cheek kiss, and they all break into laughter. Ben looks back down at his food, picks up a pee, tosses it at an empty chair across from him. Practicing. Interior dorm bathroom night. Ben, in full pajama, brushes his teeth and practices facial expressions. Big smile. Frown. Smirk. Smirk again, because the first one wasn't great. Soft smile. Someone walks through the door. Ben quickly goes back to brushing. It's Carl. He heads to the toilets, but pokes his head back when he sees Ben. Hey. Hi. Ben spits out the toothpaste. Hi. Uh, I haven't seen you around here before, man. You live on the floor? Yep. Carl expects a longer answer. Cool. Well, I'm Carl. Good to meet you. He sticks out his hand to shake. I don't. Not into handshakes. I, I get it. Don't know where my hands have been, <laughs> you know. Ah, uh, that's gross. We just met. Carl studies Ben for a bit, who is not used to this type of scrutiny. He's kind of funky, huh? An off-key ding rings out as Carl says funky, heard only by Ben. That's cool, man. Uh, normal people are so boring. That's what I say. Sorry, my guy. Didn't mean to make you uncomfortable. You want to come by my room sometime, play some games or smoke or something? Got some friends hanging out right now. Ben tries to put on the smile he was practicing. It's not great. I'm in my pajamas. Oh, yeah, for sure. 817, doors always open. Literally, we leave the bolt on so it can't close. You get it? That's bad for personal security. Yes. Yes, dude. Hilarious. <laughs> come by whenever. Ben rinses out his mouth and leaves. Interior Ben's room night. Ben scrolls through mom's songs again. His thumbs hovers over a song. He decides against it, instead putting real clothes over his pajamas. Exterior Carl's dorm apartment night. Ben stands outside the door in his clothes, a bit of a pajama peeking out from underneath. He hears buzzed revelry from inside. Ben sees the door is bolted open. He tries very hard to muster the courage to knock, starts to panic a bit. Drinking on a school night? For shame. 
Carl opens the door, beer in hand, sees Ben right there. Hey, man. Came down to the PJs. Nice look. Silence. Ben has a deer in the headlights look. Want to come in? I, um, no. No. School night. You get it. Another very bad smile. Then Ben walks back to his room. All right. Yo, are we getting shitty school pizza or what? SSB pizza, give me a ticket. Yo. Interior Ben's room night. Ben, back in his pajamas, swallows himself in his mom's blanket, then plugs his phone into the speakers, goes to mom's songs, and plays a saddish love song like Romeo and Juliet by Peter McPolin. Ben starts to dance to the music, moving around his pretty small room using the blanket to accentuate the dancing. He's not very good, but he's free, completely unconcerned with potential ridicule or saying or doing the wrong thing. After a bit, someone knocks on his door and he snaps back into his normal and shuts off the music. He answers the door. It's Rebecca, also in pajamas. They don't recognize each other. Look, sorry, it's late and tomorrow's the first day of class and I'm trying to get some sleep and your music's keeping me out. Too loud? Well, too loud, too good. <laughs> I mean, but also, yeah, too, too loud. I'll put on my headphones. Thanks. Have a new window. She hands Ben a healthy-ish Oreo. It's like an Oreo, but good. Well, better. <laughs> is this a Pavlov thing? Sure is. See ya. And she leaves. Ben closes the door. A little smile crosses his face, a real one, with just a tinge of confusion. He's not entirely how he managed that conversation so well, short as it was. He lies down, puts on his headphones, and closes his eyes. Interior Ben's room morning, 10 a.m. automatic by the Black Keys, or a similar high-energy rock song with a specific reference to the morning time, kicks in. Ben's eyes open. First day of school montage. Ben puts news, news notebooks in his bag. He dresses a little too formally. In the dining hall, he spoons scrambled eggs onto a plate. Toast pops up from the toaster. Ben walks on campus eating his impromptu breakfast sandwich. Students next to him stepping in time with the song. First class, big lecture, bald math teacher. Everyone except Ben opens their notebooks at the same time. Walking on campus again, some passerby moshing it up. English class, another lecture. English teacher asks a question to the class. A student responds, nailing the drum solo. Another question from the teacher. Another student slams the drums in perfect time. Walking again, Ben unboxes food truck food, takes a bite, looks over, and sees a bunch of friends rocking the guitar at the end of the song. Interior Palmer's classroom day. Ben walks into a small seminar classroom. He sees how small the room is, and the song comes to an end. He looks around, checking if he's in the wrong room. A polka dot dress wearing student, already sitting there, notices him freaking out a little bit. Uh, history 241? Ben checks. 241 100. Oh, same number. You're in the right place. Oh, okay. He sits down. Other students quickly file in, fill in, including Rebecca. Hey, cookie guy. What's up? A fluorescent light. Overly literal. That's fun. I, I mean nothing. What's up with you? Professor Palmer walks in, starting class. All right, everyone, shut up. <laughs> Class time. Polka dot, do this part for me. Asking, he's asking polka dot to set up his computer with the projection system. Polka dot does. A little taken aback. And welcome to History 241, titled and ostensibly about an overview of the Holy Roman Empire, but in reality, more a series of Germanicish tangents I think are interesting and technically classified as history. Now, everyone bought their textbooks, yes? I'm looking at you, PDF Pirate. PDF Pirate is Ben, who looks scared. The class laughs and Ben follows along. I'm kidding. Did anyone buy their textbooks? No? Good. You're learning. Fuck the system. I can say that because I'm tenured. I will be marking down foul language in this classroom. Shitheel here knows what I mean. <laughs> Another round of laughter. Ben looks around at the enthralled class in awe at Palmer's charisma. 
kidding again. <laughs> Polka dots moving a little slow and it's the first class. So how about a round of icebreakers? There will be much discussion in this discussion class. So get comfy with it. You, curly hair, get us started. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Rebecca, a uh, second year from uh, New York City. Um, Which borough? Jersey City. Oh, yeah. And I'm a public policy major. In a history class? I like medieval things. And <laughs> how'd you spend your summer? Interned at a civic defense law firm uh, in Manhattan. A lot of filing. <laughs> oh, bet. Literature lar larcenist. You're up. Name, year, major, summertime, go. Uh, I, uh. Oh, let's try again. Go. Ben. Good. Second year. Perfect. Undecided. That's allowed. And my mom died. Uncomfortable silence. Ben realizes he didn't quite nail the icebreaker. Okay, well, let's skip the rest of the intros, yeah? Murmurs of approval from the class. Polka dot? Polka dot finishes setting up the computer and a slide pops up on the screen, welcoming people to the class. Ah, the Holy Roman Empire. According to philosopher and genius Voltaire, was it no way holy, nor Roman, nor an empire? Of course. That statement was from the 18th century, and the HRE had been around for roughly 1,000 years by then. Plus, Voltaire's real name was Francis Marie, and that sounds like a liar's name. So let's dive on in, and hopefully in 10 weeks, you'll know if Voltaire was right, or if he was just some dumb French aristocrat. Aristotelian wannabe. <laughs> the class laughs. Ben loves this guy. Later, the class starts gathering up to leave. As we're wrapping up, I want to instill this in you as you get to your readings. The most important word, why? Always ask why. Why did they write this thing? Why did they write it and how they did? Why am I assigning it to you? Use it in real life. Why am I in college? Why am I taking this particular class? Why do people throw sticks of deodorant at me? Could lead to some profound discoveries. Hey, look, book bandit, hang on. Ben stops putting his stuff away as the rest of the class leaves. Um, am I in trouble? You think you get in trouble on the first day? <laughs> no, I, uh, look, I wanted to, okay. I put you in a rough position there, and I want to acknowledge that, so I'm sorry. I'm fine. Oh, great. Well, look, I feel a little icky still, so if you're feeling things are, you know, stuff, and, and you want to talk about it or whatever, my office number is on the syllabus. Thanks. He does that practiced smile again. Yeah. Palmer is a little unnerved by the smile. Exterior quad day. As Ben leaves the class, he notices Rebecca chatting with her friends as they walk to the library-shaped brutalist travesty, the Regenestein Memorial Library. Then he sees Carl and that group messing around as well. A lot of people out here, all socializing and having a good time. Too many people, too close to him. Ben tries to calm down with deep breaths, doesn't work. He puts on his headphones and tries to play music, but his phone is out of battery. Interior Palmer's office day. A medium-sized office filled with books. Palmer sits at his desk with a whiskey glass or something, probably whiskey, a, bex a big exhale. He was on in that classroom. Now he's off. A knock at the door. Still not interested, Kate. Ben walks in. Who's Kate? Oh, hi. A colleague wants a co-author. Oh, did you forget something? If you have a question, email is normally better. Do you have a phone charger? Is this a prank? Did Bellew put you up to this? Is Baloo Kate? I'm not going to answer that. You said I could come by your office for whatever. Oh, I meant that in the more metaphorical sense. You know, like, sorry, your mom died. I want you to know that I know that and it sucks. But don't actually take me up on this offer. You know, that sort of thing. Oh. 
The tinge of sadness behind the practice smile Ben starts to leave. Wait, oh, come on, sit down. Ben does. What kind of phone do you have? I mean, it doesn't matter. I only have the one cable. Here, let me see it. Ben hands over his phone. Palmer plugs it in. Oh, good. It fits. Silence. Uh, can I offer you something? Some whiskey or... How old are you? 19. Oh, I offer you alcohol and you tell me your actual age. I don't like lying. Right. Why do you need the phone so bad? I mean, it couldn't wait until you got home. I need it to get home. Do you live in Oz? No, it helps me. I think the most accurate way to put it is not freak out. There's a lot of noises here and people. It's overwhelming sometimes. Sometimes? All the time. It's always overwhelming. Palmer chuckles. <laughs> You're funny. Literature larcenist. I don't mean to be. Mm, still. So, you're a little unique, huh? Well, that's got to be fun. Another ding. Ben flinches just a bit. It's not. I was being facetious. Oh, right. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> Words was got. It's rascal. Oh, rascal isn't alliterative. My name is Ben. They give us these, these name sheets with your pictures on them, but I never look at them. Ben, huh? Short for Benjamin? A little boring, but classic. From the Old Testament. Benjamin, like mine. Like your what? Name, Adam. Old Testament. Don't call me that. Professor Palmer is fine. Okay, Professor Palmer. More silence. Palmer checks the charge on Ben's phone. Only 2%. He sighs. Huh. Professor Palmer, can I ask you a question? Oh, sure. And you don't have to call me Professor Palmer every time. Uh, use it normally. Like you see me in the hall. Hey, Professor Palmer. Like that. So what's your question? You seem very... The class laughed a lot. I think you have this thing called charm. You seem likable. I would like to, at some point, be also likable. Do you have, is there maybe some trick? Oh, you want friends? I think so. Well, first off, don't second guess yourself. I think so isn't an answer. Maybe isn't an answer. Desire is a binary situation. You either want something or you don't. You want friends? Yes. Great. Second off, that feeling I assume you have, like there's a wall, a metaphoric walls. Since I'm getting the vibe, I shouldn't specify that aspect. I mean, between you and what you want, I mean, everyone has that. It sounds like maybe yours is a bit thicker, well, maybe made of steel instead of plywood, metaphorical again. But at some point, we learn how to punch through it. There's no secret way around, just through. You understand? I, I think so. Understanding is also a binary. Then yes. Some quick, excited intro of a song, maybe Good Times, Bad Times by Led Zeppelin. Exterior midday park evening, Ben walks home ex exuding, what is that, confidence, while the song keeps playing. Some soccer players on the midway are kicking the ball around to the beat of the song. Exterior Carl's dorm apartment night, Ben once again stands outside the door, staring it down. He raises his fist to knock and lowers it, then, spurred on by the song, raises it again. Ben knocks on the door, ending the song. It's open! Ben pushes the door open while remaining firmly in the hallway. Carl has a dorm apartment with its own little living room and kitchenette. Ben sees Carl's squad hanging out, playing Smash Bros while drinking alcohol. I want to be friends. Fucking love the one or two, my man. Get in. And here, Carl's dorm apartment night. Carl gives a quick intro to each of his friends. Gabe hates politics. Also loves politics. Basically. Prithi from Western Pennsylvania, not India. 
Um, Eric does not technically meet the federal designation of being a drug dealer. Because look, I'm going to be a pharmacist anyway. I'm just getting a head start. Emma makes outrageous claims about classical philosophers without evidence. Hi. Hi. Ben is immediately smitten. Hi, I'm Ben. Why was my introduction the only one involving race? That's effed up. Sorry, Quizzy. The only one of us that have an STI. A hole. Krithi hurls a pill at Carl's face, gets him pretty good. Everyone laughs. Ben also laughs, following along. Interior Carl's apart dorm apartment later. Ben plays Super Smash Brothers with Carl. Krithi and Eric chat over on the side while Gabe and Emma watch the game. No, okay. You're intentionally mishearing me. Okay. Explain what a nation's value is clearly evident in its GDP is supposed to mean, if not exactly what it sounds like. Carl wins, jumps up. Yeah, woo, suck my dick, yeah! No, thank you. Snickers all around, Emma laughs. No, 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 it's, it's don't actually suck my dick. No problem. Another laugh from Emma. Gabe, you're up. Gabe grabs the controller from Ben. Go easy. No. Emma walks to the kitchenette. Ben sees her go, then follows in an awkward enough way that it distracts Eric from his conversation. Emma reaches into the fridge for a beer. Hi. Hey, want a beer? Like with alcohol? No. We used $80 fake IDs to buy non-alcoholic beer. Facetious. Mm-hmm. Ben's pleased with himself for picking up on that. So, beer? No pressure. I'm not... Well, a little pressure. Then yes. Please. Yes, please. Here you go. She hands him a can of beer from the fridge, and Ben grabs it. His hands brush Emma's. He's spellstruck, just staring at her. What? Do I have something on my face? No. Sorry. You're just so pretty that I forgot what I was doing. Emma laughs. Uh, is this you flirting? Not intentionally. I'm just saying things that are true. Okay, good. Because that was a little too direct. Are you going to drink that? Or would you rather stand here awkwardly looking around each other? He pops the beer open and gives it a little sniff. Not a huge fan of the smell. I've never had beer before. But you've had, like, drinks before, right? Yes. Normally water. Sometimes root beer. You are flirting with me. No. What? Hey, hey, pause that damn game, Carl. Bye, 20 seconds. No, pause it. Dave pauses the game. Okay, shit. You can finish winning in a second. Benjamin here is about to have his first ever alcoholic beverage. Eric. That's not me too, is it? No. But he's under but, 21. But he's under isn't 21. That isn't that a felony? Sorry. Sorry. Says the drug dealer. Substance provider, please. This feels like a lot of pressure. We can all turn around if you want. Give me a second. And Tad's. Can I? Whatever, you need, whatever makes you comfortable. Ben goes through the, his, the phone, then selects a song. Okay. Too young by stoplight observations begin. Ben drinks the beer. All right, Shellen, welcome to the club. Oh, shit. Um, isn't Maddie's party tonight? That's right. Ben, you win? Sounds like a lot of people. Super low key. It's at a friend's apartment. First Friday in the quarter, man. You should come. Ben looks at her. Exterior Madison's apartment night. The song continues through Ben's headphones. Everyone gets off the school shuttle at the apartment north of campus. Opening, carrying half empty bottles of liquor and an open 12 pack of cider. They all, except Ben, see people they know going to the party and greet them. Ben's starting to look overwhelmed until, until Carl guides him inside. Interior Madison's apartment at night. They all walk in, drop their coats to the empty 
bedroom near the door. Ben stands behind them as they all greet people, grab drinks, and otherwise break off from the core group. Ben stands near Carl the whole time, headphones on. Everyone at the party bobbing to the beat of the song. Carl introduces him to various people, but in a not that sincerely way. Emma comes up to him with a red plastic club from which Ben drinks. Interior, another yeah. apartment, night. Song continues a few days later, another party. Ben's more into it this time in a conversation circle with Emma and several others. And he's actually engaging. Emma tries to pull him to dance. He shakes his head no. The circle breaks up. He's standing next to Carl as the latter chats up a girl, put, putting his hand on her back. Ben play, pays strong attention to this move. He takes another swig of his drink. Interior, another, another apartment night. Yet another apartment party. Song continues. Everyone, including headphone-less Ben, is pretty drunk. Beats echoing the first two parties repeat here, but sloppier and more chaotic. He si slips into a drunken fugue of laughter and weird movements and having a good time until plops down on the couch. He looks at his left, sees Emma right there. Apparently, they're in the middle of a fun conversation. She throws her head back laughing, then leans in. He copies Carl's hand on the back move. They start making out, and the song comes to an end. Smash to black. Interior dining hall morning. Ben walks with his bowl of cereal, extremely hungover. Headphones on, no music. Yikes. Rebecca's sitting at a table he just passed. Ben lowers headphones. What? I said yikes. Hello, intern Jersey girl, Rebecca. Loud music cookie guy, Ben. Yep. Rebecca gestures for him to sit down. Does that mean you want me to sit? It means you can sit if you want to, but should feel no strong obligation one way or another. Ben tries to think about what that means, but he's still a little buzzed. Yes, yeah, sit down. He does. You look awful. I feel awful. Eat this, it'll help. She shoves her plate of bacon over to him. Pavlov again? Rebecca smiles. It's turkey bacon. I don't eat pig. Jewish. Really only in that regard. Ben takes a bite. Rebecca goes back to eating. Ben searches for something to say. I like your bracelet. Rebecca feels with it in a vaguely longing sort of way. Thanks. It was um not important. It sounds important. Rebecca doesn't want to go down this conversation path. <laughs> Cheerfully ignoring Ben's point. What are you listening to? Oh, nothing. Sometimes everything is just too loud. Also, I'm hungover. Good night. Long night. That is why I always go to bed before 12. Smart. I do that sometimes. The headphone thing, earbuds for me, though. Um, not a big music fan, but I do like the occasional podcast. What do you mean? I just know a bunch of people around campus. Sometimes I don't want to have to stop and say, hey, what's up? How's Schuster's class? No, she did what? 42 times on my way to the library. That's a lot of friends. Rebecca shrugs. You don't like music? No, I mean, it's just nothing special to me. I mean, oh, cool. You put tones in an order and parrot it with an angsty poem. Oh, wow. I mean, no, no offense. Are you flirting with me? I'm not entirely sure how you got that from this conversation. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what flirting is. Hmm. I'm currently seeing someone anyway. Oh, okay. Seeing is a strong word. I'm not really feeling, you know, relationshipy right now. Um, I mean, how do you not like music? Oh, good. Another personal question. My favorite. <laughs> I have to play you something. Is there a genre you can tolerate? Look, loud music, cookie boy. Law intern, Jersey girl. The whole undefined, not you guy thing means you can't flirt with me either. I was just copying you. I already like someone else. Because, I mean, people have tried the whole, you just haven't heard the right song thing like a hundred times before. Music's just not for me. And I'm fine with that. You should also be fine with that. And then we can move past barely aware acquaint classmates to slightly in the know class acquaintances. 
that's a portmanteau of classmates and acquaintances. You've only listened to 100 songs? That's like saying you hate cookies, but you've never had chocolate chip. Was that your first time making an analogy? Pretty much. Carl, Eric, and Gabe walk by with their own food. And Carl says, There he is! Bro, nice moves. Benjamin. 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 <laughs> they laugh and smack Ben on his back in the way that people do in a congratulatory way. Rebecca raises, raises an eyebrow at him. I think I kissed someone. You're very comfortable sharing information with people you don't know that well, aren't you? When I want to know them better. Mm, yeah, I'm not really a sharing person. That's allowed. I'm going to talk with my friends now. Thanks for the turkey, ba turkey bacon, class acquaintance. Sure thing. Oh, and um, sorry about your mom. I, I meant to say that earlier. I know it sucks. Okay. Boys table, Ben sits down. Yo, it's big boy Benji coming in for a landing. Thank you. Carl, Eric, and Gabe. <laughs> Dude, do you even remember what you did last night? Parts. But not like that part. What part? That part. You know, that part. That this is unhelpful. Part. This is unhelpful. Dude, you full on made out with them. Do you not remember? He doesn't remember. Ah. No, I, there were parts that I... <laughs> Emma and Kritha walk up. Hey guys. That orange dreamsicle drink is dangerous. Uh, he hi, hello, Emma, and hello, Kritha. Everyone except Ben and Emma burst out laughing. Emma looks a bit embarrassed, Ben bewildered. Bro, be honest. Was she your first kiss ever, first ever kiss? Carl! She smacks his arm. Yes. Carl, Eric, Game, and Creepy give him a standing ovation. Ben beams. Guys, come on. That's a big deal. How was it, huh? I don't remember. Yeah, he was blackout. I was crossed. Come on, not a big deal. Oil sport. Everyone takes a seat. Emma smiles at Ben in that these guys, am I right? Way. Interior Palmer's classroom day. Palmer lectures on in investiture converse, uh, controversy 1076 to 1122, spaced out. He's daydreaming. For these reasons, the emperor was hesitant to give up the power of lay investiture, claiming that these demands from the church was a blatant power grab by the Pope, which obviously it was. Rebecca tries to focus on the lecture but is both confused and a little uncomfortable by Ben staring. She keeps looking over at Ben. A few classmates notice this and also look at Ben. Palmer checks his watch, then notices Rebecca's discomfort glances. He too looks at Ben. His lecture slows down. Not to say the crown's attempt to retain this power was not grabby and of itself because it obviously was. Slowly, the whole class looks at Ben. Ben is still in his daydream. Palmer matches Ben's eyeline, walks right in front of it. Hey, bud, what you thinking about? Ben comes out of it. He looks around at everyone looking at him. Some giggling. He smiles, very much not in on the joke. I made out with a girl at a party, and it was fun. The class is silent. About 70% of the class and Palmer turn to look at Rebecca. No, someone else. The class explodes into laughter. Palmer squeezes his eyes, then claps a few times. Rebecca can't believe what she just heard. Ben doesn't totally get why everyone is laughing, but still smiles. All right, get out of here, everyone. Class over. Paper prompt on the website. Jesus Christ. Everyone packs up. Rebecca looks over at Ben again and laughs. Palmer walks out. Ben walks out. The tear hallway is continuous. Palmer and Ben turn the same way, 
walk down the hallway. Palmer glances at Ben. Ben gives him a practiced, hey there, smile. Not so bad this time. Palmer nods. They keep walking. Where are you heading? Your office. Palmer stops to take a breath. Ben stops after two more steps. Is this about a class thing or what you just brought up in class? How much does my answer influence whether or not you let me into your office? Interior Palmer's office day. Ben paces as he talks. This might be the most energetic he's been so far. Palmer sits at his desk, whiskey glass in hand, listening. But I didn't remember too much the next morning, but when the guys told me what happened, and also after I stopped being hungover, I started to remember it better, and it was great. I think. It's still a little fuzzy, but the parts that are there were great. Yes. Palmer nods, taking in the whole explanation. It was my first kiss, so big deal is what I've been told by my friend. So... And I think I'm nervous. I'm not completely sure. I've never been great with emotions. My mom would always... A tinge of sadness invades Ben's face. He shakes it off. But, when, but she's really pretty and she smiles at me a lot, which makes me feel happy and it makes me feel like I want to spend long periods of time with her, which is really, really very surprising because... Uh, stop for a second. Stop talking. Sit down. Ben, ben sits. Palmer centers his thoughts for a second. How long have you known this girl? Emma. AHP, no names. That's a degree of intimacy I'm not comfortable having with someone I've never th I'll never think about again in a few minutes. How long have you known this girl? Oh, a few weeks. So you don't really know her. You've hung out a couple of times. Nine times. Now, when you say spent long periods of time with, and I'll preface this question by saying that I'm not super caught up with the courting rituals of your generation. Do you mean like a girlfriend or just someone to mess around with every now and again? A girlfriend. And by mess around with, I mean have sex with? Ben reconsiders the question. A girlfriend. I've never had sex. Thank you for sharing. So what you're saying, if I may condense it, is you're lonely and want a comforting presence. Who's a girl and likes me. Well, I'm not going to ask you, say, a little personal. How are you feeling regarding your mom dying? Palmer treads more carefully. He's comfortable with the superficial stuff. Nothing deeper. How is that related? It's related. Fine. It happened. People die. It's normal. Yeah, that's one way to look at it. Ben shrugs. Is this one of those times I should be sad? People die. It's a natural event. I don't get sad when people get older. I don't get sad when, when, when I eat, you know? Or fecking breathe. Or when there's a full moon. It's natural. It happens. Can't help it. That's life, you know? Sorry for swearing. Don't worry about it. Um, those nine times, were they one-on-one? -on -one? Huh? Oh, no, in a group. But we made out. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that a few times, actually. Ben looks upset. Oh, don't read into this. Uh, my psychologist friend said this once. When bad things happen to us, i.e. Uh, mother's death, it can trigger a pathological drive to secure ourselves against that pain. Well, for some, they wade into mind-altering substances i.e. cocaine or really expensive sushi. Well, for others, they might dive into interpersonal relationships they wouldn't otherwise want. Do you get what I'm saying? Maybe. I don't understand metaphor. Hmm. Uh, see you in class. Uh, don't put off the paper. All right. We're going to take a minor, 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 like pause for like an intermission type thing to switch who's sharing the screen real quick. You guys are doing awesome. I'm loving the script so far. Um, so I will stop sharing so Angel can take over that and action description. Thank you, Angel. Do, do, do. All right. On my screen, it looks a little off center. Uh, never mind. I just have you guys all covering it. <laughs> 
that's on me. All right, everyone's good. Everyone can see it. Yeah. Okay. Got thumbs up. And okay. Take it. If you want to start reading, Angel. Yep. I can hear you. Sounds good. Interior Ben's room night. The last bit of a soft love song, maybe My Lover by Bird Talker, plays through Ben's speakers. He types away at his history paper, already on page four, but he stops right in the middle of a sentence and pulls up Emma's social media. He scrolls through it as the song plays. He smiles. A knock on the door as the song hits its climax. Ben turns off the music. Ben answers the door. It's Emma. Hi. Hi. You busy? Writing a paper for history. A history paper. How about you? No. Emma giggles. We're all going to go get high and watch a movie that is, according to Carl, seriously fucked up in about an hour. Wanted to let you know. You wanted me to know? We're friends. You're fun. Finish your paper and come hang. Ding. I've never been high. We've never done a lot of things, sounds like. We should change that. <laughs> yeah. She touches his shoulder. He instinctively pulls away. So we'll see you later? Yes. Oh, uh, and I was thinking maybe we could. No, nope, no, nope, forget it. I'll see you at the movie drugs thing. Cool. <laughs> she leaves. Ben returns to his paper, starts to, starts to type half-heartedly before lightly smacking himself in the head. Stupid! Another Stupid! Knock. Ben nearly trips trying to get it open as fast as possible. Okay, so... Becca. Expecting someone else? Perhaps a certain... <clears throat> <girl? clears throat> the hall at Emma, still walking away, then back at Ben. She raises her eyebrows. Blonde? No. Whatever you say. So not to pry, but... um. I'll turn it down. That's presumptuous. What's the one you were just listening to? You like music now? I would like to maybe listen to that specific song at some point in the undefined future. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. It's a love song. Oh, thanks. The lyrics didn't give that right away. Facetious. More sarcastic, but yeah. They stand there. Do you want to listen now? Extremely presumptuous. It takes Ben a second. Oh, oh, no, not, I'm not, that's... Rebecca smiles devilishly. You're joking. I'll be more obvious about it in the future. Thank you. Here's the song. He shows her his phone. You have a problem saying the word lover out loud? I, I don't like to say the titles out loud. Kind of ruins the song. Okay, I can dig that. She just kind of stands there. How's the paper going for you? That's something people ask each other. It is. Good job. Anyway, gonna work on it at the library later with some friends if you wanted to come. So you're sharing now? Sharing time and or space is not the type I'm opposed to. That time I was joking. I'll try to be more obvious in the future. Ha ha. There's a real smile under her sarcastic laugh. I'm almost done with it, actually. Oh, so you asked me just to brag? Pleasant side effect. Gonna get high and watch a quote, seriously fucked up movie, unquote. Sounds fun. Hopefully. Interior mm -hmm. Carl's dorm apartment night. Cell phone point of view. Eric finishes packing a bowl. Ben and the rest of the crew, minus Gabe, sit next to him. You're up. Rolling. I don't understand what's happening. We're recording for posterity. Ben's first high. He presents the pipe. This is so dumb. Let's just watch the movie. Seconded. This is the big moment in little Benji's life, okay? Chill. You ready, Ben? Yes. How does it... You just breathe in. Carl will handle the thumb movements. Thumb movements? I don't have a ton of space, guys. Don't freak, man. I got you. Okay. Ben takes a toke while Carl holds the pipe. Okay, now you just hold it in. But only as long as you can. Ben starts to cough over and over. Ah, too long. Drink this water. She hands him a glass of water, but he doesn't have time between coughs. Everyone laughs, mostly with Ben. Cut to interior Carl's dorm apartment later. Ben sits next to Emma watching a movie with the rest of the gang. 
He's having a rough time, moments later. Big squelching blood noises, a chainsaw, other horror movie things. Ben is truly uncomfortable. Moments later, er, a calm moment from the movie until jump scare. The gang jolts and then laughs it off. Ben jolts and then curls up into a ball, pulling his sweatshirt's hood way down over his face. More horror, stabbing, squelching noises. Ben covers his ears with his hands and pulls himself in more into a ball. I hate it. 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 I might hate it. Everyone laughs. I got to pee. Five minutes. Five minutes. The Gabe goes to the bathroom. Sure. Eric pulls out the pipe and offers some to Krithi, who accepts. Ben comes out of his bowl. I'm going to leave. Go on a walk. In the dark? Don't get fucking chainsawed. Hey, don't be a dick to him, all right? He's, you know. Ding. Oh, yeah. Sorry, man. Hey, man, I'll, I'll take one walk with you. Keep watch for any leather mask power tool murderers. Exterior quad night. Ben and Carl watch a family of rabbits on the quad. Most of a rabbit's heat loss happens through their ears. Thanks for the rabbit facts. You're welcome. One of the rabbits hops over and nuzzles other another. What did Emma mean earlier that I'm, you know? She means you're, uh, you know, man. Unique. Interesting. What Woodstockers would have called Groovy. Cool. Ding, ding, ding. A little pause as Ben par- parses what that means. Then the fourth. Ding, ding. She thinks I'm cool? Yeah, dude. You're awesome. The random facts, the straight no bullshit responses, all that, man. She digs it. How much does she dig it? I'm starting to think when you have very specific stone behavior, only asking questions about people named Emma. No, I just, I don't know, think she's cute. I fucking hope you think she's cute, dude. You guys full on hooked up at a party or did you forget? I thought we just made out. Yeah, it's a broad term. Why is it really any sort of sexual activity? Like making out is hooking up, but hooking up isn't necessarily making out. Like squares and rectangles. Oh, I love nuance. Sargasm? Yes, my dude. Learn that shit. Carl grabs his shoulder and shakes vigorously in a way that men do sometimes. Ben tenses up. My bad, man. Little fuzz in the brainstem. You get it. They watch the rabbits again. So, you've slept with women before? Yes, several. Why? Pro tip, lots of movies and shows have people fucking to music. Do not do that. Creates a whole rhythm thing problem. And then if you have different music tastes, she might get up in the middle of the action to change the song, which, I mean, you get. Sure. That's not what I was going to ask about, though. Oh, my God. You like Emma? Yes. You want to fuck Emma? Uh, I knew it. It's pretty obvious, I thought. Well, now that you bring it up, I mean, yeah. Oh, oh, you want my help? Yeah. I think she's cute and I want to date her, but I don't know the processes. Processes. Dude, delightful. No worries, man. I got you. You know what? I've never thought of her like that, but I guess Emma's pretty hot. And nice. For sure. Look, my mind's already racing with these intricate, beautiful plans. I'm thinking group hang, seg into solo hang, make a few solid jokes, a cute little cop plan turns into dot, 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 late night hang. That seems complicated. Not at all. She clearly dug you at that party, right? So just go to more parties? No, man. Go to the party. What do I mean? Great question. You just keep go. You just keep doing what you're doing. I talk you up, talk about your jokes, your brains. How's your body? Take off your shirt. I'm kidding. It's 40 degrees out. We do that group hang, etc. Stuff I said earlier. That's phase one. Then, you ready for the shit? Yes. 
Not good enough. Yes. And phase motherfucking two, the devil in the details party. You get some drinks in, get some dead skin, then let your mouth, little mouse do the double tango all night long. You know what I'm saying? No. You're going to hook up. Which kind? Whichever kind you both want. I'm fucking cold. You coming back? I'm going to stay here, I think. Think about the plan. Watch the rabbits. Carl heads out. This plan's going to W-O-R-K work. Phase two. Ben sits on a bench to watch the rabbits. Uh, what's phase two? It's Rebecca on her way back from the library. Her friends in a gaggle off to the side, including Mike from earlier. Komal, 21, Mike's girlfriend, and Daniel, 22, Rebecca's guy. Hi. Hi. I'm watching rabbits. It's hey. like they're in their own little world until... Yo, Bex, you coming? I swear to God, you call me Bex again, I'm going to rip your genitals off and ship them to your grandmother. Ha, <laughs> my grandma's dead. Items. Oh, shoot. I prefer to leave his genitals alone. Thank you, Angel. <laughs> I yeah. prefer he use my actual name. Yeah, seriously, though? You coming? I thought we were going to boink. I'll meet you in a bit, okay? Works for me, babe. He goes in for a cheek kiss. She dodges out of the way. No PDA. My bad. The gaggle moves away. There were fewer violent threats last year. She didn't mean it, sweetie. Probably. They're gone. Rebecca walks over to Ben and offers a seat on the bench. Like she did in the dining hall, she sits. Who are they? Friends. And a boyfriend? Uh, boyfriends require a level of emotional intimacy I don't really possess anymore. He's a guy. What happened? Nice try. You don't like sharing. That's fine. You know a lot of people. A couple dozen. They're all your friends? Depends on your definition of friend. Which is? Rebecca shrugs. People I can talk to? Mine too. I have fewer. Rebecca thinks on that a moment, then goes back to watching the bunnies. I think you're my friend, going off that definition. So what's phase two? Carl's helping me with a girl that I like. The girl you kissed that you told the whole class about after staring at me for five minutes? Yes. The way you said that makes it seem like you're teasing me. I am. Okay. Then I am embarrassed, but the right kind of embarrassed, where you don't feel bad, but you know you had an effect on me? People thought we kissed. You have what I would call a boyfriend. Have is a strong word, but that's what I told them. I'm still not flirting with you. I like rabbits too. Thank you for the clarity. Um, oh, sorry. You're welcome. Give me your headphones. That's like asking a normal person to give you their large intestine. In that you could technically live without it, but it would be extremely uncomfortable and you'd prefer to keep it? Exactly. I, I meant the chord. You showed me a song. I show you a song. I've heard it's the unspoken rule of enjoying music. You're a fast learner. Yeah, we'll see if that sticks. Ben hands his ox chord over to Rebecca, who plugs it in. She hits play, and Ray Charles' song kicks in. Maybe even it makes no difference now. Ben knocks off his headphones. You know, you should treat your large intestine better. No, it's... Not a Ray Charles fan? No, it's... My, my mom used to... Oh. It's not, I, I'm gonna leave. Thank you for the recommendation. It's horrible. I'm sorry. Ben hurries away once again, overcome by a slew of emotions that he doesn't know how to process. Rebecca looks after him with a degree of worry, but doesn't follow. He scrolls through the music and can't decide. His emotions take over. He hurls his phone away. Ah! He punches a tree. It hurts his wrists quite a bit. He sinks down, back against the tree, heads in his hands, head in his hands, stays there a moment, feeling a wave of discomfort and grief. He hears a little rustling in the bush. A bunny hops out. 
Ben wipes his face of any potential tears. A second bunny. The bunnies nuzzle each other. Ben puts his headphones back on and plays My Lover from earlier as he watches the two lovebirds or love bunnies snuggle up. Interior, interior dining hall day. The song continues as Ben, now with a wrist brace, sits next to Emma while eating. They're laughing, having a good time. The other friends are there, but Ben isn't looking at them. Exterior quad day. Ben walks to class, sees a couple, sees couples everywhere. Undergrads studying on a blanket. One shuts their books and kisses the other on the nose. Two grad students lying on the couch, on the grass, holding hands and cloud gazing. Ben looks up. Even the clouds have formed a heart. Interior library night. Song continues. Ben shares a package of M&Ms with Emma as, as they study. Exterior library night. Ben and Emma walk outside, having a decent time. Ben sees couples all around them, moving quick arm in arm before starting a lovely waltz under the night sky. Emma heads out, but Ben's too busy watching the dancers to notice. As the song finishes, everyone returns to being a normal human being walking through the paces. Ben looks around for Emma. Interior Palmer office, day. Palmer grades papers at his desk. Ben walks in the door, his wrist in a brace. Do you understand the concept of appointments? Here's my question. Is it about your final? No. Then the question is, I don't know, or I don't care, or it's something you will only discover through life experience. I'm stuck. That's not a question. Why do I feel stuck? Sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, how, we're how could... going to have a break um, because I missed and I don't actually know where it is. Okay, I'm sorry for screaming. We were going to take way. a break at page 50. Yes. Or could we is. at least after this uh, scene? It's sure. not okay. super long. How could I possibly know the answer to that? I can't stop thinking about Emma. Name. I can't stop thinking about the girl I like. We've been spending some time together, which is nice, obviously, but I don't know. I don't feel much closer to her. We haven't hooked up again. This is borderline inappropriate. Carl, my friend, whose name I didn't say, said it's all part of phase one. There's phases now. Great. But shouldn't I still feel some progress, something before phase two? Is that all the phases? My mom fecking died, okay? Can you fecking stop with the jokes and just fecking help me? Palmer and Ben are both shocked. I get you're going through something, but you absolutely cannot speak to me like that ever again. Understand? Yes. Sorry. Ben turns to leave. Oh, no, don't leave. Take a seat. Ben takes a seat. I need you need to. I mean, you need to understand that what I am about to ask is, as far as my personal behavior goes, exceedingly rare. I'm making a special case for you because of the aforementioned deceased mother. And, and I will deny this if anyone asks. I find you tolerable. Now, are you okay? Yeah, it's just a sprain. No, not your arm. Wrist. Are you okay? Look, I've been in almost your position before, and I've noticed you're getting a little testy in class. You're getting not quite obsessed, but certainly very focused on this girl. We all deal with grief differently, but- I'm not grieving. You just swore at me about your mom. I was angry, not grieving. I already told you, death is natural, it happens. The existence of something in nature doesn't predefine our emotional response to it. It should, makes it easier. Well, look, when you, if you start to not grieve, but feel certain ways, I'm, oh, never mind. Finals due next week. Have a good break. Thank you. All right. So we're having a little break here. Five minutes. I'd like to just apologize for the screaming. There are a lot of non-biblical swears in a part of the script, and I don't say those. It's um, fine. It's say what you're comfortable from... with. It's yeah. he's having a breakdown. Whatever. So I decided to scream it. like this and just to go with that instead so of the non-biblical swear. Which is fine. And just when it's really loud like that, it shuts it off so you can't hear yeah. it. So we don't hear it yeah. and we're not deafened by it. So feel free. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Just in case right. anybody wonders, I don't no, use non-biblical we know. in script and um, performing. So yeah.
All right, see you in about at 25 after.
All right, it is 825 or whatever, 25. Just waiting on Petra and Aaron. And why does my screen not show everyone? I'm here, I'm just chilling. <laughs> okay. Same. I don't know why it doesn't show. I'm back. Also, since I know I shot this to you, Angel, but uh, since uh, Jacob's off for the rest of the night, right? Yeah, we already figured that out. Oh, I don't okay. know for the rest of the night, but it's for a while. Okay. So, uh, Krithi, he only has a few ones coming up. And then there's uh, the angel and demon at the party. Mm hmm. Um, I think that's it. Because, yeah, Polka Dot only shows up at the beginning. So, yeah, that's it. Just since I know that they're coming up in the scene. Oh. Uh, okay. And I'm very sorry that I forgot Kamal. I had three names written down back to back, and they were in such tiny writing. It was like, I'm it's missing very something. It's easy for that to happen. I know. <laughs> I was trying oh, to be so confused about it, though. You know, next this week and next week will be, I think, the funnest I've ever had this year, besides the Carter one, I think, as long as I get the part that I applied for. <laughs> okay. I hope so. I sent in the tape already. Oh, right. You wanted to change that one to a different one, didn't you? No, I want to be con. I am con. I am con. I sent in the tape. Okay. I Okay. You don't watch that <laughs> until like we're casting. So <laughs> I don't know if Roger's gonna be here next week and he really wants it. <laughs> um, would he like to fight for it? I don't know. Are we gonna have what is that fight thing? Krapnar or something? Are we gonna have a battle royal? Yes. Roger, please. <laughs> I really want it. This is my dream. We have the battle my royal. Like, so uh, okay, uh, you already had like dream casting last week with, you know, you got to play. I know, Carter. but my late father was really into the original series era Star Trek. And so to be con would honor him. Whatever you want, whatever you want to and do. And I want to be the one screaming full power, damn you. <laughs> okay, well, just no, don't three quarter power, maybe six, 60 sixty percent power for screaming on Zoom. Otherwise, we'll blow out a speaker. Nobody wants that. <laughs> 60 sixty percent power, perfectly acceptable power for Khan. Okay. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ready? One's back. Okay. Interior: yeah. Carl's dorm apartment, night. Ben and the gang cheers with a variety of shot glasses. End of finals. They down their shots. Eric's goes down fine. Everyone else's sputters. What the fuck is this? Is in this dude? Do you like it? No. This is really bad. Holy <laughs> heinous. But it's part vodka, part gin, a dash of triple sec, a drop of bitters, most of a lime, and some simple syrup. Oh. It's disgusting. Stick to weed. What's it called? I don't know. I just threw some more leftovers in the shaker with some ice. Never, ever be a bartender. Ever. Good aftertaste, though. Another round? To the end of the fall quarter? They all here. <laughs> Good Chicago dorm day. Ben and Emma wait with their bags among the small throng of students getting picked up by the taxis or their families. Midway? Oh, hair. Too bad. We could have shared a cab. Ben considers whether or not this was a flirt. Yes, too bad. Is it okay if I text you over break? I kind of figured we're at the stage where you don't need to specifically ask. But yeah, I guess so. Carl shouts next to a cab he hails. Hey, midway, right? See you then. Have a good break. She kisses him on the cheek. Carl gives him a huge cheer. Emma turns to leave. Carl plays, tries to play it cool. Rebecca comes up on Ben's other side. Lucky guy. Hope so. O'Hare? Mm -hmm. Interior, exterior, Uber day. Ben and Rebecca sit in the back. You guys not going home? No, he is. But you're here. I am. Are you fighting? His flight left yesterday. You have other friends. You're my friend. Depends on your definition. Yeah, well, I'm going off yours. Did you not want to share a ride? See, this this is why I don't share things. I don't share feelings. I don't share memories. No, I don't share songs, apparently. Songs, plural? Yeah, I had like two more for you. Oh, sorry, I freaked out. I get it. 
I share a smile. If I let you show the other song. Hey, I'm not going to negotiate a burgeoning friendship, Ben. That's ridiculous. Give me the damn plug. Fair. Ben hands her the aux cable. She plugs it into a splitter, her ear, her, her earbuds in the other port. Good Feel by Boy Named Banjo starts playing. This one's a little closer to what you showed me. A horn honks to, on the beat. A driver in the ca car over smacks the steering wheel in time. Ben sees Rebecca subtly playing air banjo to the song. An electronic billboard shows the lyrics as they pass. The motor of the passing traffic copter plays into the song somehow. Ben starts to barely play air drums. Rebecca glances over and smiles. Exterior O'Hare Airport Day. The song continues, continues quietly in the background. Ben and Rebecca grab their bags out of the trunk. So pretty good, right? Yeah. yeah. Going right on my front flight playlist. Awesome. You should send me some more songs. And then I'll send you more songs. Friendship, you know? Wait, would we be sharing? <sighs> Not if you keep asking dumbass questions. I will only ask smart questions from now on. <laughs> See you later, Ben. She gives him a hug, and weirdly enough, he doesn't tense up at all. In fact, Ben hugs her back. Not super hard, just a normal hug, but still. Interior Grandpa's home day. Grandpa opens the door as Ben pulls his luggage inside. Dinner's in a few hours. Interior Grandpa's home upstairs day. Ben lugs his suitcase upstairs, drags it to his room. He passes a room with Mary's photo nailed to the front. Interior Grandpa's home, dining room, night. Ben and his grandpa eat dinner across the table from each other. A few half-assed Christmas decorations around, including the under-decorated Christmas tree in the corner. On a nearby table is a small shrine dedicated to Mary, consisting of a few photographs of her in her healthy days. Ben occasionally glances over before averting his gaze. How are your classes? I pass them. That's good. Grandpa notices Ben glancing at the shrine. I kept it in her room, but I kept forgetting. I thought, I haven't seen her in a few days. Then it hurts all over again. Ben doesn't respond. Grandpa goes back to eating. Ben stands up, walks over to Grandpa, and gives him an awkward hug. Grandpa softens. There's a girl I like. Her name is Emma. Grandpa laughs at the sudden, change of, sudden subject change. He wipes away his slightly moistened eyes. Oh, hell. You've been making friends. Yes. There's Emma, who's great, and Carl, who's great. Creethy, Eric, and Gabe were all in a group. Then there's this other girl, Rebecca, and we talk sometimes. Friends are nice. Guess it's only right. The universe balancing out the bad with the good. Yeah, balancing. Interior Grandpa's home, Ben's room, day. Snow falls outside. Ben, wrapped in his mother's blanket, stares at his phone. He scrolls through texts with Emma. Perfectly fine conversation, if not an engaging one. His phone buzzes, a message from Rebecca, including a link to a new song. Ben smiles. Interior Grandpa's home, upstairs, day. Ben stands outside his mom's old room, deep in thought. He looks at the doorknob. He reaches for it, then stops, then reaches for it again, then stops. He puts on his headphones, flicks through his phone to his mom's Ray, Char Ray Charles song, and hits play. He reaches again, turning the knob. The door swings open, and ben face, Ben's face twists into a nigh-inscrutable frown. He wills the tears away before shutting the door and turning off the music. He walks away from the door. Interior Grandpa's home day. Ben pulls his luggage to the front door. You're excited to go back? I am. That's good. Before we head to the airport, I wanted to, oh hell, I want to say it looks like you're doing well. Better than I thought you would. Yes. I'm truly happy to see it. And I know she would be too. This hit's been hard. Oh, good. Exterior, it, it, you Chicago, oh, I see now. You Chicago dorm day. A light snow falls as Ben pulls his bags out of the car. Other students are arriving too. As Ben pulls his luggage into the dorm, he slips on some ice. Carl walks back, walking back from the dining room hall with Emma, laughs uproariously, then comes over to help. No snow back home? Lots of snow, less ice. If you waddle on the ice, you won't fall. Like a penguin. 
Devin the Penguin. Carl and Emma laugh like maniacs. I don't get it. Oh no, it's it's a. I explain it, but it's a whole story. Yeah, sorry. Oh, that's fine. Sick man, appreciate you. Oh, that's that's right. Devil in the details. Friday. I didn't forget. Did you? No. Something happening at the party? Not something you should worry about, right, Ben? Right. Yes. Do not worry. You're a dick. Carl gives Ben a thumbs up behind Emma's back. Ben gathers himself and his luggage and follows after them. Interior Palmer's office day. Palmer taps away at his laptop, takes a sip from his glass. Ben walks in. No. (laughs) No, I checked my roaster this quarter and you're not on it. Ben sits down. I'm nervous. I'm working. Ben's too engrossed in his concern to notice the dismal dismissal. Can I ask you something before you give me the lowdown on whatever teen angst or dead mom problem you're having this particular week? Yes. Rhetorical. Why me? Why? 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 Why do you come here? Interrupt my free time when there's literally dozens of people employed by the school to do this exact thing. There are? There are. Therapists and psychiatrists and free ones, too. I don't know them. I know you. That gets to Palmer, just barely. Fine. Drink? I'm still 19. Just tell me the problem. I'm going to a party Friday. And you've never been to a party? It's a big one. It has a name and everything. Congrats. Thank you. It's a big step. The girl I like will be there. There's a whole plan. Darlene. Emma. I tried. Right. And the party is when phase two starts. When I tell her that I like her. And then, if it works, we make out again. You want my advice for big parties? Don't go. I mean, not worth it. Too loud, too many people. I am wary of loud things and crowds. See? You know what you like. You don't need to change for other people. Growth is a part of attending school. There's a difference between growth and change. Look, you like this girl. (laughs) You like any girl. Next time you see her tell her i mean simple no beating around the bush no coy quest guessing bullshit hey emma i'm into you and i'd like to take you on a date or hang out or netflix or chill or whatever the fucking line is nowadays ben considers this it feels hard you remember the wall this is just another one and if you rely on tricks and alcohol to get around the wall well he takes a sip of whiskey You'll never learn to knock it down by yourself. Originally, I was supposed to punch through it. It's a metaphor. The objective isn't always consistent. But the party! It might be easier. Uh, Doesn't mean it's better. You know what I mean? Interior Ben's room night. Looking at the mirror in the mirror, Ben smooths out a nice shirt and pants that he's not totally comfortable in. Carl pushes the door open. Offers Ben a shot glass and a pair of extremely nerdy glasses. Ready? Phase two. Interior hallway night. Hallways night. Carl, Emma, Eric, Krithi, Gabe, and Ben walk through the hallway dressed in various degrees of stereotypical ner- nerds. A few other groups of undergrads also walk ahead to the elevators. Walk. Obviously, all heading to this party. Rebecca walks out of the communal kitchen right into the group. Hey. Hey, hi. I haven't seen you yet. This year. Is what I meant. Are you coming to the party? That's all we're, that's where we're all going, to the party, to the big party, with all the people and noises. The group has moved past Ben by now. You sound excited. I might be, not sure. I'm not going. Doing a board game night with the friends. She points to Mike, Komal, and a few here to four unseen friends trying to bake cookies in the kitchen. I've seen some of them before. Yeah, they're the friends. Where's the guy? He wanted more, I didn't. Sorry. Nah, no big deal. 
can't get hurt if you don't let them in, right? That's sad. It was a joke. A sad joke. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Look, we're playing Dominion, which is card based, but close enough. That sounds super fun. Through the glass, the friends have all noticed Rebecca talking to Ben and stopped baking to watch. I mean, better than Catan. Anyway, you don't want to know how many relationships that game has destroyed. How many? Four. Wow. Komal opens the door. The other friends turn back to their cookies. Cookies are almost done. We also have cookies. Rebecca and Ben keep standing there. Komal steps in. Would you like to join us? Uh, thank you, but I'm going to a party. Phase two. Of course. Phase two. For the girl you like. Good luck. Thanks. He hugs her, heads off. He's the song guy? No. They head back into the kitchen. Interior school shuttle night. Ben rides on the bus, surrounded by his rowdy friends and rowdy strangers. His headphones are on. He starts to breathe a little faster, obviously nervous. He looks over to Emma, chatting with the others in the group, and only gets more nervous. He searches for a song. Just as he hits play, Carl hits the headphones off his head. Come on, no time for music, motherfucker. We're here. Exterior school shuttle frat house continuous. Stranger by Mickey Ficky plays as they get off the bus. Carl enthusiastically greets people he knows, chatting and drinking outside. Finger guns, jumping high fives, grabbing drinks out of their hands in time with the music as Ben walks behind. Carl waves Ben up to the entrance. Interior frat house continuous. On Holder 20, Carl opens the door to a somewhat chill party. Following the theme, the house is decorated with notebooks, TI-84 calculators, anything nerdy with a hellish twist. Most people are dressed as nerds, except the frat brothers, who are all dressed as angels and devils. Carl leads Ben to the drink table. Carl hands Ben a rose, a, a red solo cup of beer. On Freedom uh, 29, Ben looks up, sees his friends are already moving into the party. A few kids push up in front of Ben to grab some alcohol, including Emma. Ben smiles at her. She smiles back. They say some words. Emma laughs. Emma leaves. Ben tries to follow, gets blocked by a devil lunging in front of him to grab a plastic gla shot glass. He sees Emma across the party now laughing with, the group and, with a group and Carl. Carl catches Ben's eye, nods like, get over here. Ben walks towards them, but on Hounds 40, a horde of people walk through the door. Ben tries to move through them, but can't. People bump into him. He gets knocked around in a circle. The bass picks up and he's bumped faster and faster. On where, 58, they stop. He's smack in the middle of a huge crowd, but completely alone. On Stranger, 103 or 202, the crowd pulses out, then in like a tide. He looks for an escape. On Breaker, 1.10, a portion of the crowd parts. He sees Emma chatting with friends and tries to get her get to her. But the crowd comes back on please, sealing him off. Each At each symbol crash, he sees a friend through the crowd. Eric handing off a baggie of weed. Prithy chatting with some people. Gabe telling a perform performative story to a group of rich-looking kids. But the crowd crashes back together before he can get to them. Ben puts his head down and shoves through the crowd. At walk you through the door, through that door, he finds a couch in a less crowded corner and sits down. He lets out a long breath. Gabe sits down next to him, hands him a beer. On, does it make any sense? A party goer passes in front of him, and it's now later. Ben's more drunk and dishe disheveled, nodding along to whatever. Gabe's ranting at him. Ben sees two bros mouthing along to the song. Is all because of me. I blame it on you. Devil bro somewhat playfully attacks angel bro. They move out of the way, and Ben sees Emma again, talking with a group of people, including Carl. Ben stands up to reach her, starts walking. Eric swings over, claps him on the back and encourage, in an encouragement on, I am doing fine, he gains confidence. Ben reaches Emma, he freezes. Carl pushes him away gently into, into Emma. She laughs. Ben and Emma take a few steps away from the group. Ben looks at her, she looks at him. He takes a moment. Just as he starts to talk, she sees Carl start a ping pong game. She walks past Ben and instantly disappears into the crowd. The chorus, plays again and Ben begins to panic again looks for his friends can can't probably find any the crowd once again surrounds him parting on the cymbal crashes but he can't see anyone through them 
he pushes through them again and on walk you through that door he finds an empty bathroom he turns on the sink splashes some water on his face he takes another sip of beer he opens the door the party has and the party has calmed down a bit still a lot of people but not an overwhelming amount he walks through the party looking for his friends he sees carl and emma kissing in the middle of the room he walks up to him slowly the crowd moves with him carl sees puts his hand out like he's trying to explain himself then at 3.2 symbol crash then punches him in the in the face the scene turns to a slow moving tableau backlit with red light as ben follows through carl reels emma watches in horror as the dozens of party goers flailing along with the punch carl recovers ben tries to punch again but carl grabs ben and shoves him away again the scene turns into a backlit slow motion tableau the party goers now moving in the opposite direction of ben time resumes some frat bros grab ben manhandle him toward the door he struggles against it hating being touched ben's friends watch silently exterior frat house continuous they shove ben down the steps he stumbles and falls into the ground someone tosses his coat onto him the song ends ben lies there black interior palmer house day ben slowly comes up comes to on a strange couch he looks around the room more curious than afraid he sees classic house decor, frames things, a few awards, some plants, a border collie, Six, walks up to him, nuzzles his leg. Hello, I, I love you immediately. Oh, slow down, Casanova. Catch. It's Palmer's house. That's Palmer's dog. Palmer tosses an Advil at Ben, who doesn't even try to catch it. He's very hungover. Or don't. Palmer walks up, hands Ben the Advil bottle. Take one or two. Not more than four, though. That'll mess up your liver. What's your dog's name? Lola. From the song? No. Ben takes the Advil with a sip of couchside Gatorade, then keeps petting the dog. I take it phase two didn't go as planned. No. Carl kissed her instead. Rough. And then I punched him. I... Okay. I thought I had a response for that but i do not there's a question i assumed you'd have asked by now and honestly i'm a little concerned that you haven't how did i get that here <laughs> yes that one you were passed out drunk i was walking the lug here was worried you'd die i didn't want to call the ambulance and saddle you with the five thousand dollar hospital fee blah 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 ben smiles do you have food? Interior Palmer's house kitchen day. Palmer serves Ben an omelet and toast. I haven't cooked for anyone else in a while. Ben takes a bite. It's good. Something's on your mind. Don't tell me what it is. My grandpa said something over break. Oh, fuck. Something about the universe balancing out the good and the bad. The bad being my mom, the good... Here's what I don't understand. My mom is dead. That's a bad thing. A very heavy bad thing. He pushes a large piece of omelet to one side of the plate, the bad side. Friends, that's a good thing. A small good thing. He pushes small pieces of the omelet to the other side. Girlfriend, that's a big good thing. Good grades, small good thing. Mentor, small good thing. I'm not... Oh, shit, you're right. But all these good things still so much smaller than the bad thing. I didn't even get a girlfriend, so that's not even... He moves the girlfriend piece off the plate. And if you look at the two sides, it's very, 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 very much bad side, and it's only a little good side, and that doesn't even seem fair. It, it seems maybe like I should get a girlfriend. And maybe I should get the best grades in the lottery and maybe even a free car. And then maybe, maybe it would be even. And maybe it would be even because right now it's not. Omelette's bit scatters from his plate. Some hit the floor, which Lola eats. Can she eat that? No, oh, it's fine. I think I'm going to throw up. Mm. Interior outside bathroom moments later. Palmer stands outside the bathroom. Ben vomits within. Are you done? No. He vomits again. Palmer's ah! st stuck between being annoyed and concerned. Exterior outside day. Ben drinks Gatorade as he walks with Palmer and Lola. 
what happened? Oh. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh. Is Jacob back? I guess he's back. There we go. Okay. She Sorry, liked... there's any questions there. I did not do that intentionally. It asked me about taking co-host back. Um, Don't what... lie, Jacob. It's a power grab. <laughs> anyway, back to character. What, uh, uh, where are you guys at? I know I'm somewhere near here. Yeah, this is it. She <laughs> likes you. Animals are easier. The air makes me feel better. You punched a kid? Big fresh air fan. Palmer looks at him expecting an answer. I was drunk. So all that I'm 19 stuff, that was nonsense. You're not mad? What does my emotional reaction have anything to do with it? You're 19. You're an adult. Palmer can see Ben shut down, then reconsiders. This guy, punch face. Carl. Right. Punch face. You told him about your feelings for the girl. Emma. I told you about the name thing. It's impolite. I don't want to get attached, but you told the guy how you felt about the girl. That is what happened, yes. And he still went and stuck his tongue down her throat? And then I punched him. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would have done. <laughs> okay, good. No, bad. You don't want to end up like me. Respected and old? Lola pees on a nearby tree. No, no, I'm not bad. It's, it's not important. Look, here's what you do. Apologize to punch face. I don't want to apologize though. He betrayed me. He kissed a girl you, you made out with one time. I mean, who cares? In five years, you won't remember either of their names. Then why apologize? Well, let me pull an example from class. When Duke Henry rose up against his brother, King Otto, he probably had good reason. Or maybe Otto levied unfair taxes on him, or maybe Otto made out with his crush when they were teenagers. But the only story we hear is the rebellion. Now, Henry, the pissed off brother, Henry, the bad guy. Don't be Henry. You know what I mean? Is this a metaphor? Because I'm still very bad at metaphors. A story spread quickly. When people tell the story, they're going to tell the exciting part, the punching part, and they'll make up the reasons to suit the story. And people will think certain things of you, that you've got anger management issues, that you're crazy, that you're naturally violent. And if it goes on long enough, you'll start to think those things of yourself and then you'll be alone. Palmer kneels down to scratch Lola. Mostly alone anyway. Ben sort of gets it. Interior dining hall day. Ben approaches the Carl and friends table. Gabe sees him walk up and then, and they one by one stop laughing and joking and turn to watch him. Ben notices another completely unrelated table turns to watch what he's going to do. And then several more tables. He does not notice Rebecca shush her friends to watch whatever is about to unfold. Hi, I'm sorry. Or? For hitting you. Carl looks at his table. Come over here, let's stop. Carl leads Ben by the shoulder, which Ben hates, over to a corner. The onlookers have returned to their conversation. Rebecca still watches him while sitting with Mike, Komal, and Daniel. You heard what happened, right? Like the wacko freaking bit him or something. No, I heard it was a full-on fight. Don't talk about him like that. Carl lets out a big performative sigh at them. What are we going to do now? Regarding what? The whole situation, my guy. You physically assaulted me. That's sort of a red line. I apologized. Plus, I know Emma doesn't feel comfortable around you anymore. But I didn't hurt her. Not physically, man. And here. And here. And for it. But I said sorry. Sometimes sorry isn't enough. Like, for example, when you fucking punch someone in the fucking face for no reason. I told you I liked Emma and you still kissed her. Some people turn to look at the outburst. 
smaller. Man, don't spaz out. Emma stands up from the table and marches over. Someone way off another table cheers her. Fuck off. Everyone turns back to their food, embarrassed. Rebecca keeps watching their confrontation. Emma arrives at the pair. You two are talking about... You're talking like I'm not sitting 30 feet away. And Jesus, fuck you guys. Ben, I'm sorry. I was drunk the first time we kissed. I didn't think it was a big deal. You also kissed me on the cheek. But I'm an infectionate person. I spent a quarter in Paris. I was figuring stuff out. Or do I have to have static feelings to fit into your bizarre little world? Ding, much harsher. Ben physically cringes from the noise. I liked you. You never told me. You can't stand around and expect people to magically discern how you feel about things. That's not how people work. He kissed me. I kissed him. We kissed each other. Whatever the fucking events of the evening, Ben, your freak out was embarrassing. It was scary. And none of us want to be around you right now, especially me. Ben looks at Emma, then at Carl, then over to the friend table, then all around the room. A lot of people are looking at him. He walks out of the room, then hurries, then runs. Rebecca watches him go. She follows, food half eaten. Interior Ben's room day. Ben slams the door closed, almost leaping to bed. He puts his headphones on, searches for a song, playing the beginning of many songs. Someone knocks on the door. Ben opens it. It's Rebecca. She sounds physically distant. Hi. Ben doesn't say anything. Look, that was rough in the dining hall to watch, probably more so to experience. His face squints into an expression of miserable confusion. We can talk about it if you want. Ben doesn't respond. Rebecca's feeling a a bit vulnerable. No. Ben closes the door. He keeps trying to find a song, wrapping himself in his mom's blanket. He lies there, all sorts of emotion flying across his face. Anger, sadness, fear, anger again, a laugh for some reason, just chaotic. The white noise grows louder, then suddenly shuts off. Interior Ben's room night. Ben's phone lights up, alarm going off, completely soundless. Ben wakes up in the early morning, still dark, depression montage. Ben puts on, puts his notes in the backpack. A pen falls to the floor. Ben looks at it, decides to leave it. Ben dresses warmly but sloppily. He stands at the dining hall. Rebecca waves him over, but he doesn't register and sits alone. Ben walks to class, surrounded by heavily jacketed students. A few people bump into him. He doesn't react. Ben sits in class, watching the lecture, barely taking notes. Ben walks through the quad, catches the eye of Emma, Carl walking right next to her, puts his arm around Emma. Ben looks down. Ben stands at the street corner, cars whizzing by. He doesn't register them at all, his head still down. He steps off the corner, potentially right into traffic. Exterior, the reg present night. Everything's silent again. Ben walks into the iconic brutalist library. Interior, the reg night. Ben types at his laptop, consulting his notebook, dead eyes. His headphones are on, but everything is still completely silent. Palmer, walking through the, with a handful of books, notices Ben. He thinks to himself, weighs options, then decides to walk over. Hey. No response. Ben? Palmer jabs Ben's shoulder. Ben looks up, gives a weak smile, returns to his computer. Palmer sighs, puts his books on the table, walks away. Ben tries to focus on his paper, but his eyes glaze over. Palmer's back, places a coffee cup on the table. I don't drink coffee. It's hot chocolate. Hey, did you hear me, Ben? Palmer jabs him a little harder. Ben looks over. It's hot chocolate. Exterior, the reg night. Palmer smokes a cigarette. The sound is literally audible, but something's still off. I didn't know you smoked. If it's self-destructive and legal. Palmer uh, looks over at him. No quick and overly literal retort. No. All right. Ben sips his hot chocolate. You haven't come by in a while. Ben doesn't respond. I wanted to make sure you were still alive. I see that you are. (laughs) And I will now let you go back to your paper. You gave me bad advice. Hmm? I apologize and now I'm alone. You punched him. I apologize. 
And the apology doesn't suddenly make it so you didn't punch him. This is a consequence, Ben. <laughs> Apologizing doesn't make it magically better. It makes it not worse. And now I'm alone. Palmer looked down at himself, checks his arms, touches his face. Sorry, for a second there, I thought I didn't exist. Ben lets a brief smile escape. <laughs> Do you know how many of my students I can name from the last... I don't know, 20 years? Four? None. Ben's smile is gone. Palmer looks at him, sighs again. Look, you've heard the only way out is through. Well, that's where you are right now. It's gonna fucking suck for a while. No way around it. But you've got at least one person rooting for you and willing to help a little bit. Don't take advantage of me. The best thing you can do is move through it. Find new friends, a new crush. A new mom? Palmer stops. It's all coming up now. Palmer pulls out a flask, takes a swig. You want? I'm still 19. <laughs> I've seen you blasted drunk. Ben just looks at him. Palmer reacts, retracts the offer. Losing someone is different. I mean, it's, I don't know how to explain it. Are metaphors completely disallowed or just discouraged? Discouraged. Okay, it's like this. Right now, you're depressed. You feel either nothing or like shit. I'm just empty. Like the plains, flat, empty, awful. Occasionally, there's the light rain, a small wave of sadness, or a full storm passes through if you're lucky. That's anger. Otherwise, nothing. Takes a drag of a cigarette. And one day, out of the blue, a little flower starts to grow right there in the dirt. A miracle. You can turn away, spend your time in the other 99% of the field, miserable and alone, feeling empty until that's all you know and all you remember. Or you can take care of the flower, water it, prune it, let it grow. And you might find more flowers, a bee or two, some trees or something, a whole garden. You'll still carry the pain that not never goes away, <laughs> but you can build on it, use it and cultivate it and make it something better than you ever could without it. Make sense? The flower is hope. <laughs> hope laughter a nice drink the flowers whatever you think it is you don't have to feel better tomorrow you don't have to feel better ever just be open to it interior of the reg night ben sits at his computer starts typing again exterior quad night ben walks home his feet crunching the snow the sound continues to fade he squeezes his eyes hard trying to fend off another emotional thing he stops standing in the quad. Suddenly he flings off his backpack, takes out his laptop and starts beating the backpack into the tree, a cymbal crash with every hit. A group of students hurries away from him, leaving Rebecca standing there. Ben's out of breath. He returns the laptop to his bag. He sees Rebecca looking at him. Ben zips up his bag to hurry away, but Rebecca walks to him too fast. She doesn't notice, or he doesn't notice, but she's wearing a small flower beret barrette in her ha hair. Ben. Hey, Ben! She grabs his arm, forcing Ben to look at her. She meets his eyes. I know what you're going through. Let me help. No, you don't. Ben leaves. Exterior, you Chicago dorm day. Another start of break. Another start of break day with students hopping into their cars, soundless. Ben stands there alone. Mm. Interior grandpa's home day. Ben pulls his luggage through the threshold. His grandpa says something, but he doesn't hear it. Interior grandpa's home upstairs day. Ben drags his suitcase into his room, to his room. As he passes Mary's room, he hears something, a small musical cue. He opens Mary's room. Interior Mary's room day. It's a normal room, a little dusty, mostly untouched for a few months. Some pictures of young Ben and Mary around the wall. He touches a knickknack on her desk. One of those little salt lamps on the bed, another mom blanket. Ben sits on the bed, wraps himself in the blanket, his head tucked down. Ben, what are you feeling right now? Match cut to exterior grade school flashback day. 
Young Ben Seven stands outside the school with his head down. Mary, his cancer-free mom, stands over him. I don't know. Good or bad? I don't know. Mary crouches down, pull, gently pulls his face up. His face is a little dirty and he's got a small cut on his chin. You're angry. I can tell. And a little sad. That's okay. Feelings are okay. You know that. All feelings. Okay. Mary smiles. Interior, Mary's car day. Mary drives him home. Ben sitting irresponsibly in the front seat. You know the best way to let it out? The best way to feel the feelings? Ben shakes his head. Mary lowers the windows and angry screams in the air. Ah! Try it. She screams. Ah! Sorry. Come on with me. She screams again. Ben no notices Ben is just sitting there. Not a screamer? That's fine. They pull up at the red light. Mary goes through her iPod, iPod with the scroll wheel, which is plunged into the car, plugged into the car. She picks a song. This is what I do when I'm just furious. She puts on Bulls, Bulls on Parade by Rage Against the Machine. Hear that guitar? How mad it is? She starts headbanging a little. Yeah. What do you feel? I don't know. Yes, you do. Don't think about it. Come with it now. Mary is really going with the music. Young Ben looks at her. He said the F word. Don't listen to the words. Listen to his voice, his emotions, what they want you to feel. Let it wash over. Young Ben's head just barely starts to move with the music. Mary glances over while driving. Yes, yes, Ben. The chorus hits and Ben starts flailing. Yes, amazing. Feel it. Ah! Mary joins. They both break into laughter. Perfect, Ben. I love this kid. Interior Mary's room day. The sound is distant. Ben is having a full-on emotional catharsis in his mom's bed. Grandpa hurries to the door. Ben see sees Ben. He sits on the <laughs> bed next to him. He puts his arm around him. Ben fully leans into him, still sobbing. Exterior, you Chicago dorm day. Ben returns to campus. People returning, greeting friends. Hiding from the spring rain, muted, but at least a little bit there. Interior dining hall, day. The sun shines through, barely audible. Ben eats alone at the table. Over to his left, his old group of friends laugh, ignoring him. Over to his right, Rebecca, Mike, and Komal have an animated discussion. Ben goes back to his food. He hears a muted Rebecca, and only Rebecca, above the distant background noise. I mean, I'm sorry, do we need to resurrect Thomas Hobbes and ask him? Because that is literally impossible. I know, I've tried. Ben, surprised, surprised to hear anything, looks up at her table. Mike says something in response. Okay, lock then, William of fucking Orange. Whoever, come on, stop laughing. I am dead serious. To convince you, I'm right. And you're, I have two treatises of government right here, motherfucker. Homal responds. Ben notices the small flower bar barrette. Plato, you're insane. Ben walks over to her. Hi. All three look at him. Hey. Argument over. We win. Come on, run. He and Kamal grab their trays and run to the drop off. Put it in your pub pole paper, bitch. I dare you. I I interrupted something. I'm sorry. Nah, it was over anyway. I like your flower. Thanks. It's a barrette. I'm sorry. You tried to help and it's fine. Ben smiles, Rebecca softens. Nice day out. Exterior mid park midway park day. Ben, or ben and Rebecca take a scroll. That's amazing. In the face? Yeah. I mean, I heard rumors, but <laughs> damn. And over Emma? I mean, girl's fine, but like, come on. Jealous? Yes, I have a massive crush on the guy who shared music with me and then didn't talk to me for three months except to tell me to fuck off when I was trying to help him out. Sarcastic. Maybe. Yeah. <sighs> I apologized. You're still mad. I'm not mad. Okay, that's a lie. I'm a little mad. But let me get in some barbs for a day or two and, and we'll be good. I was going through something. 
Yeah, I could tell, believe it or not. Still am, a bit. Can still tell, believe it or not. They walk in peaceful silence. Rebecca tries to get something out. When my, um... It doesn't work. When you're what? <sighs> Never mind. I know what will help you feel better. Come to Mike's apartment tonight. I'm not really a party guy. No shit. It's more of a friend hang with alcohol and snacks, and also there's music in the background, if that makes it any more tolerable. That sounds like a party. I don't. Yeah, here's, here's the thing, though, is that you're actually going to come, because despite your insistence that no one else could possibly understand what you were going through, I do, and I know what will make you feel better, and it's a friend hang with alcohol and music. Ben considers it. I'll give you a Numino. Sounds good. Interior school shuttle night. Ben sits in the shuttle, surrounded by loud students. He has his headphones on, fiddling with the unconnected end. Exterior apartment night. Ben stands outside at Hard Park apartment. Headphones on. Compares his phone to, his, to the address. Hits the buzzer. Interior apartment night. Ben enters. There's a bunch of people there. But it's not fully a party. Rebecca, in the middle of conversation, sees Ben, lights up, and rushes over to him, putting a cookie in his hand. How long have you been holding on to this? The cookie or the bit? The cookie. Uh, about 20 minutes. Oh, you have to meet some of my friends. She guides him over to her mic and Komal. I've seen you before. Rocks. Likely. Sup, man. Mike. Sup? Really? He's been getting really into 90s slang lately. Don't get me started. I'm Kamal. Hi, Ben. Oh, we know. Mike. Is that a good we know or a bad we know? A little bit of both. Mostly good. Oh, phew. Mostly. They all laugh. <laughs> Later. Ben walks over to the drink table, pours various liquids into his cup. Hey. Ben turns, surprised to see Emma. Hi. I didn't think you knew Rebecca. Gabe knows Mike from Mun uh, Six Degrees. We thought it would be more of a party party. She gestures over to Ben's old friends, who are all staring at right at him. They look away. I'm sorry for what happened in winter. You already apologize. I'm also sorry for that. That was, I'm supposed to be sorry, sorry. This is, I recognize what I did was wrong, sorry. I'm not flirting with you. I didn't think you were. And look, thanks for that. Carl's still pissed, but maybe I can talk to him. Pull a miracle off and get him to chill the fuck out. How's that going? I mean, yeah. I don't know what that means. I mean, me neither. Carl slides up and puts his arm around her. Is this guy bothering you? Carl. No, I'm... Relax, man. Just playing. All good here. You get it? Emma rolls her eyes. Carl leads them away. I don't. Huh? I don't get it. I don't know what you mean. I don't get it. I never get it. I just don't. I want to. I'd like to be included in your secret coded language that you and everybody else has. They can express whole ideas with the right twitch of an eyelid or a certain gesture at a particular time, but I don't see the world like that. I don't see it like any of you. And that's, then it's not that I don't want to. I'd love it. I'd love it if I woke up tomorrow and was just like you. And I just knew the right speed to throw food at a friend to make it playful or what exactly these mystical signals people send to each other when they're into the mar, but I can't. I cannot do that because there is a big fecking invisible metaphorical wall between me and all of you. And I guess that makes me funky or fun or what you call unique, interesting, what would stalkers would have called groovy, cool. Ben hits his glass with a fork at each thing, making but a ding. But then they realize I'm not making jokes. I'm not playing around. This is really who I am. And then they say what these words really mean. I'm a freak. 
or that kid with anger management issues or just fecking weird. I don't like it. Ben realizes the entire friend hang is looking at him. Sorry. I'm sorry. 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 He runs out of the room, grabbing his coat on the way. Rebe Rebecca follows, but not before chastising Mike. Damn it, Mike. Exterior Hyde Park night. Ben hurries towards campus. Rebecca catches up to him. That was an impressive speech. Ben doesn't say anything. Hey, joke's on you. I'm fucking great at being ignored, okay? I did it all the time in high school. You followed me just to rub salt in the wound? I think I used that right. Yes, because that's exactly the kind of person I am. Sarcastic. No shit. Slow down a bit. My legs are shorter than yours. Ben slows down a bit. And that is how you use the expression, just so you know. Thank you. Silence. Also, just so you know, you are really fucking weird. By far weirdest person I have ever met. Finally, someone says what they mean. Weird isn't bad, Ben. Weird is a gift. Do you know how boring life is for normal people? We go our whole life and the sky is just the sky and the grass is just the grass and buildings are just buildings and people are just people. No matter how amazing something is or inspiring to look at something is, it is only ever going to be what it is. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know how you experience life, but I know you better than you think I do. However, you see the world is fantastic. And I know it's hard for you to communicate or whatever, but when you get someone to understand you, you can open their mind, help them see the world in a new way, in your way. And that's a gift. I don't have the strongest emotional control. Maybe I should just be alone. You don't have to keep walking with me. Yeah, well, too damn bad. Ben looks at her. Sorry. Or, you know, actually, I'm not. I can stop talking if you want. I can drop back a few steps, but I am not leaving you to be miserable and alone. That's the second worst combination out there. What's the worst? Great question. What's the worst? Great question. I didn't actually think that far ahead. Not even a smile. Let me show you a song. Interior Ben's room night. Rebecca plugs her phone into the speakers. Ben sits on the bed. I should just sleep. I always feel better in the morning. Do you know how many people tried to get me into music? Four? Dozens, at least. Never stuck. Just listen to the damn song. Hey Satan by Senior Sigur Ross. Sigur Ross. <laughs> it's Sigur Ross. Song, by the way. Okay. A melancholic masterpiece. Ben notices Rebecca's warm smile turns into a distinctly sad one as the song begins. He leans back to listen to it for a few seconds, sits up to say something, but instead, black. He sees Rebecca alone on a black void, dancing to the song, somewhere between ballet, interpretive, and modern dance. Conflicted, feeling the weight of loss and the barest hint of contentedness in the song. Ben watches the whole thing, completely entranced. Interior Ben's room day. The song comes to an end. Neither of them say anything. Rebecca pulls the ox cord out of their phone, then sits back on the bed, centimeters from tears. Finally, who did you lose? My first boyfriend <clears throat> died early last year, hip cancer. This was his, actually. You were the first person to ever ask me about it, you know. Same. My mom, not my... Rebecca laughs in the briefest way. She also didn't give me her bracelet. This, this was her blanket, though. I got it. Also, it was a different kind of cancer. She laughs again <laughs> and reaches out, gently strokes his arm. Later, Rebecca lies with her head on Ben's leg. They've been there for a while. There was this song she'd sing to me when I was younger. Only I looked it up a few months ago, and it turns out she always used their own lyrics. He refused to say bagel correctly, only bagel. And he would watch Canadian TV when he was a kid, liked how they said it, and flat out refused to ever say it normally. What a doofus. My mom hated sushi. Rebecca sits up, looks at him curiously. That's not a super deep one, I know. It just popped up. Look, I don't control my mind. 
Rebecca laughs, wipes her eyes. Thanks for staying with me. Anything for a fellow grief aficionado. Haven't told anyone else at this school about my thing. Yeah, you're not a sharer. I've told a lot of people about mine. She laughs. laughs. Why me? Not really sure. I guess you're just the right kind of difference. Smile at each other. Rebecca checks her phone, 2 a.m. You know how you wanted to know the signals when someone likes you? Very much. Rebecca pulls a strand of hair in front of her eyes. Here's a classic. If her hair is is like this, you know, in, in front of the eyes, you take your hand and you gently move it behind her ear. And if she lets you, she likes you. Okay. Can I try? Please. He does, but some of the hair escapes. I'm going to try again. He does. Still doesn't quite get it. Darn it. He goes to try again. Wait, I can get it. Yeah, two times is really the max. (laughs) But the hair's still there. But the hair doesn't matter. Then why even move the hair? It's to get into position to kiss her. That feels sneaky. Yeah, but it's cute sneaky. Is that what flirting is? Plus the girl will stop you if she's not into it. Feels invasive. I don't like it. Yeah, well, it's a classic. Got it. Rebecca looks at him expectantly. He's not getting it. What? Really? Really what? God, you're weird. Instead of the ding, he hears a lovely little chord progression. Ben smiles. I like you, and I'd be down, but if you just want to be friends, that's fine too. Oh. Ben crawls toward her on the bed. Still uncertain, he moves her hair away from her eyes. Exactly like that. They kiss. That was nice. Yeah. I like you too, in case that wasn't clear. Rebecca laughs. laughs Kisses him again. Interior Palmer's office day. Palmer sits at his desk, brow furrowed. Ben sits across from him, petting a sleepy Lola, the dog. I don't need to know about your sex life. We haven't had sex. Yet. Thank you so much for informing me. We are dating, though. And you've talked about that? Yes. That's wonderful. I'm very happy for you. I am also happy for me. She thinks I'm weird in a good way. And she tells me her feelings and stuff like that, which is a whole new thing for her. Fantastic. The whole flower thing. I still don't completely understand, but I think I mostly get it. I still get sad, but it's not overwhelming anymore. And I think Rebecca is a big part of that. This feels like it's leading to something. But without your help, I wouldn't have been open to her at all. Just alone and miserable. The second worst combination out there. And what's the first? Don't know. I read online that adults say thank you with gifts. And I know you like alcohol. So I I bought this. Ben pulls out a bottle of whiskey. You're 19. (laughs) Well, I paid someone who bought it for me. For you. And how much was this? 20 bucks? 33 dollars and 12 cents. Well, you're not supposed to tell the recipient of a gift the price of the gift. I will remember that for future. Palmer's touched. You're not recording this, right? Ben shakes his head. (laughs) Good. I'm about to say something sincere, and you have to promise never to say anything to any of the faculty or students. As far as they know, I'm an unapproachable Um, Not that old curmudgeon. And I want to stay that way for now. Promise. Palmer stands up, walks around the desk. You're a good kid. I'll remember you, Ben. He puts his arm around Ben's shoulder. Ben goes right in for the hug. Okay. All right. Oh, that's enough. Ben, let's go. Never again. But thank you. All right. We're done. Get out. Ben heads to the door. See you next week. Bye, Lola. Lola raises her head up, wags her tail a bit, and goes back to sleep. Palmer smiles. Exterior quad day. Ben exits the building where Mike, Kamal, and Rebecca are sitting at the bench chatting. The sun is shining bright, and nothing funky is going on with the sound. 
the basis of your arguments can't just be shouted the name shouting the names of political theorists they can and will russo voltaire cicero marx alexis de tocqueville see my boy here gets it she kisses ben on the cheek he beams ew kamal kisses mike on the cheek ew <laughs> kamal slaps him on the shoulder dick come eat food with me you got it they pull off they head off Ben pulls out his phone. Rebecca takes out her splitter. They pl- they plug in and Ray Charles, It Makes No Difference Now, plays the song he freaked out over before. You feeling good? Better. I'll get there. He kisses her again and they start to walk off. The world, including Rebecca, moves to the song, but this time, for the first time, so does Ben. They dance together through the quad in a perfect little jazzy duet. The end. Bonus credit song, Tell Me Now. Tell Me How by Mickey Fiki. Yeah. <sighs> you guys survived. Yay. <laughs> I love that script. That was amazing. It was so, wasn't it so good? See? It was. I, Lots yeah. of irony in that. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. Um, good job, everyone. And I, yeah. I'm going to we'll turn about this background off now. Yes, We'll talk about it more in a little bit, but yeah, I really love that script and you guys did phenomenal. Um, and so we'll go around and you guys can say who you are and where people can find you. And then we'll take a little break if people need it and then start talking some more. So things have switched up on my screen. So Ashaki Yoka, you're up oh, first. All right. I'm Ashaki Ayoka. You can find me on social media through ashakiayoka.com, Instagram, Facebook, and all social media platforms. And I am a voice actor, podcast host, writer, and engineer. Sweet. And Erin Lillis. Hello. Am I muted? No. Nope. You sound good. I am Erin Lillis. You can find me and my voice acting work on erinlillis.com. That will take you to a nice little link tree where you can find all my socials. Moving on. <laughs> and we got Ben, Heather Lee Cameron. Hi, my name is Heather Lee Cameron. I'm an actor. I'm a voice actor. I'm a writer. I'm an independent filmmaker, and I'm a family history research student who lives in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. Um, you can find my work on Heather and Lee Freelancer on Facebook and my YouTube channel, The Storm and Latter-day Saint. All my social media links are on my YouTube channel. And I think it's irony because that I played a individ- neurodivergent individual whose parent died of cancer when I myself am a neurodivergent individual whose parent also died of cancer. So. <laughs> Yeah, in case anybody didn't know that, now you do. <clears throat> if nothing else, it's had... give you a very good grasp on the character. So. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. Definitely. Um, and next we have uh, Vicki Dykes. Hello, everyone. I'm Vicki Dykes. I'm from Penhold, Alberta. I'm an actress, and you can find me on... Uh, Facebook under Vicki Dykes and on Instagram I'm Yoga Grandma Seven. Is it Yoga Grandma Ten now though? Or I'm just kidding. <laughs> it should be yes. <laughs> and uh, and Angelina Peterson. And you can find me on various platforms under Angel CDP. Those are my initials. Sweet. And Petra Stedman. Hi. Oh. Oh, so yeah, Petra Stedman. Um, mostly findable on either Twitter or Instagram. Um, Petra Stedman at Twitter and Petrapedia42 on Instagram. And then, of course, you can usually find me here repping with these fantastically talented people on Table Read Tuesdays most, most weeks. So we'll see how that goes. Awesome, awesome. And awesome. I'm so glad you guys liked my pick. The script was... It just called to me when I was reading it, and uh, I just was like, if nothing else, this thing needs some representation, because it's uh, not often you have a, yes, his being on the spectrum is on the, um, it's a, it's a major point to the character, but it doesn't seem to be like the only point, and 
this compared to other ones where the neurodivergence was maybe more of a hindrance and not just like something that is a part of them to work through and accept. It's, uh, yeah, I, I definitely like this one better than other portrayals I've seen on screen. So this one I would be happy to watch if it was a movie. So and you guys did great and thank you so much. And when we get after the discussion, I'll ask you, Heather, yes. about your thought of the uh, portrayal, um, but not yet. Uh, till then we got Roxane Armstrong. Roxane Armstrong, uh, actor here in Central Alberta, Canada, for anyone who doesn't know that. <laughs> and uh, I'm Roxane Armstrong on Facebook or Roxaney on Instagram. All right. And we have Roger Anthony. Hey, y'all. Uh, great, uh, great script, um, Patrick, uh, and uh, great job from everyone. Um, great job, really, from everybody. Uh, I'm an actor, writer, director, producer, singer, musician. I'm between Atlanta and New York, and I'm soon to be LA, and I am um, going to be found on Instagram as Roger Anthony D. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. All right. If you guys have made it this far, you should be subscribed. You should like. You should share. So, yes, we have to do those dumb YouTube things. So do it. Um, all right. That's the end of our share outros. Friends, share with your family. <laughs> share, with yes. Yes. share with your coworkers. Yes. And if you want to participate, most of the information goes out on our Facebook group where we have the list of all the scripts we're going to read through the year. And a lot of them have sign up forms that you can sign up there. Um, we'll add the others throughout the year as we get closer. And we put the scripts within the files there too, if you want to get the scripts for yourself to read them. Um, next year, we're planning on doing a lot more of these unproduced scripts. We'll probably do like one every other week. So we'll do like a popular script, then an unproduced a script that wins like the top award, the top competitions are on the blacklist. And then we'll do a produced one that people love, then unproduced. So many reasons for that one. I'll, again, get them out there. And we're going to try and reach out to those writers and hopefully they can come in to ask, answer questions or be a part of it. But also, again, because you guys are actors are awesome. It'd be great to see you guys in roles in movies that haven't been made. So if they go, someone sees it, they can go like, this is a great script. This person did amazing at that. Amazing. Let's make it and use them. So that's the plan for next year. Um, I have 16 years of blacklist files. I will happily send them forth. If somebody wants to help me parse through them, <laughs> we can get some good ones for next. There are some that have already the, made this. If someone didn't know what the blacklist was, that sounds bad. I have 16 years of blacklist files. It, it's good. Um, it's good. I swear. It's good. It's a good thing. <laughs> all right. Um, if anyone needs to take off because you're extra, extra tired, or it's very late where you are, we understand. We thank you for being here. Um, this will be the after discussion. And if you guys need to go to the restroom or get a drink or stretch your legs, feel free to just go and then come back. But for those who want to stay, we'll uh, start talking. So anybody have to go? Oh, no? I do. Uh, oh, right. no, I do have to go. Good night, um, Ashaki. It was lovely having you. Yes. Do you want to say Good anything night, before you leave? Um, yeah, I want to say that this was a really amazing script. I'm really happy that this is the one that we did. I also enjoyed the challenge <laughs> with the three characters. And um, yeah, I got to be a grandpa today. So that was pretty fun. Um, but no, it was like a wonderful script. And I really love how like representative it was. And yeah, thank you for having me. And I'll see you all next Tuesday. Thank all you right. for coming. And you made an excellent head banging mom. I loved it. It was so good. <laughs> Thank Just you. Thank you. Okay. See you next Tuesday. Thank you so much. See you. Bye. Bye. Good night. All right. All right. As I said earlier, Heather, what did you think about this portrayal of someone on the spectrum? Well, it kind of mirrors my life a bit. Um, <laughs> like, as I said, I'm a neurodivergent individual who lost a parent to cancer, which is incredibly sad, but I did a, actually did a little bit of soul, um, soul searching today and made my deceased parents to find a grave entry because he was cremated and we couldn't afford a burial. And I found out you could actually cr make entries for cremated individuals. So that's a little bit of therapy. And 
Um, actually, I sort of had a Ben like experience as well when I was in the ninth grade and <laughs> I punched someone who was harassing me in a in a fast food joint. And it was I was fortunate because the owners knew me. They knew I wouldn't do anything unless I was absolutely forced to do it. So I didn't get in trouble. I was an outcast in my class and this boy was in my class. I think we were on lunch from like play practice or on break from play practice and he was harassing me for money. So I just turned around and I punched him in the face and he went on the floor. And- <laughs> Did he ever harass you for money again after that? No, but he always brings it up whenever I see him, which is why I hated junior high and high school because he followed me all four years ah. <laughs> <laughs> or all six years actually. So if this movie got made and they did a, a good job with the performance, you would feel like this is one you would approve as. Well, as here's the thing. I think yeah. that I wouldn't want a neurotypical actor to, to portray the main character in this because you see a lot of the movies about individuals with disabilities, right? You see like Forrest Gump and things like that. Neurotypical actors performed disabled characters and I'm not really in favor of that I'd like actors with disability actors with disabilities sorry I'm stuttering I'm nervous I'd like actors with disabilities to take on their own roles more so if that was the case you would you would say from your personal opinion you're like I approve this movie I approve how it is and with that casting you're like I think that's it would be good uh, yeah, like it would have to be a like, I think actors can be disabled actors can be trained to portray themselves as characters. And I mean, I think they should like, especially this because you can find a neurotypical actor to play that kind of role. Mm -hmm. It's very possible. And it doesn't even necessarily Ben doesn't necessarily have to be a boy. If you have to change the gender of the main character, you can do it. Yep, yep, yep. All right, cool. The gender, the race, whether whatever you have to change to make the character suit the actor you can find, you do it. Definitely. Um, who? All right. Who else has some thoughts they want to share? But, Preston. you know, it's like, and it's, it's like, you know, some neurodivergent characters don't, or people don't mind being touched and some do, like personally. Yeah. I have a real problem with strangers just forcing hugs on me and force, I'd like, I like them to ask. Yeah. I, I, again, that's why that, I think that's probably a good policy for almost everybody to make sure that they want to hug. Well, no, but it's yes. like, it's sometimes <laughs> like say. privacy being invaded and, you know, if there's certain levels of noise, it gets overwhelming. So I yep. understand why he wore headphones. It's like, if there's too much noise, I go like, personally go like this. Mm hmm and I sometimes scream and swear and swear and have little meltdowns like you're and I do curse when I get a little anxious, which you've seen. Mm -hmm. Another good reason for like this for movies to get out there for others that don't haven't experienced that and don't have that in their life or seen that. So this can. Yeah, you know, I like mean, you said, my, my behaviors are weird enough to have gotten me shunned and social groups gossiped about kicked out of virtual social clubs. And you know what? It's OK. I. I try again after I dust myself off. Yes, I've had depression over the things that my neurodivergency has caused. I think the depression has been severe enough where I've sat in my room and felt nothing and done nothing but write for six months at a time, but I've always managed to somehow pull myself out of it. And that's what that's what what can happen to neurodivergent people if they're bullied hard enough and long enough, they can go into that level of depression. And it's quite sad. It's very realistic. Oh yeah. Um and that was like a, the speech that Petra loved. Uh, so you're still, I mean, that's something to be proud of. If you can, if you pull yourself out of any of that, even with help, you can be proud of that. But also you were still well, looking for those the flowers. Last time, the flowers the last time it happened, there was no help because it was during COVID lockdown. Psychiatrists weren't a thing. I had to work at pulling myself out alone. That's tough. I understand um, how you went through that because like just for my late diagnosis of ADHD and my own neurotypical stuff, it took me three, four years to just make a phone call all the way through mm -hmm. to finally get <sighs> my own help. Because That's when good. the on hold and stuff, it in the there's a lot of uh forking paths that will overwhelm me. 
Mm. Yeah, and phone calls are not easy things for neurodivergent people. Like, and They're the, the irony is, I'm in journalism. When I was in school for journalism, I couldn't even have a phone call. I couldn't even have a conversation. I had to do these exercises, like in church and like things, social things outside of school. I had to time myself. How long can I hold a conversation before I have to stop? I got. I had to train myself. Two minutes, five minutes, seven minutes. I had to work up to that, and it's so weird. <laughs> Because even in 2005, like 2005, when I went to college, the people weren't really into friending or wanting anything to do with neurodivergent people. Yeah. And the 90s were like god awful because when I was three years old, like my mom was told by the doctor, oh, she, meaning me, is different. You should put her in a group home. And my mom said no, and my dad freaked out. Um, and basically, I've learned since that that's when my dad stopped loving me, is when I was different. Hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm writing a script on that, by the way. <laughs> You'll see it eventually. Um, but, you know, we're not scary. We may have our little, our little fits. We may have our quirks. We may have our struggles. We may struggle to fit in, but we're not unworthy of love, just because we have disabilities and I've written essays on this where my own father deemed me unworthy of love and where people have deemed me unworthy of love. It may be hard to care about us, but we, but people shouldn't forget to care about us. I just want to congratulate you. You have a what? great job reading. Uh, <clears throat> I want to congratulate you on, on your reading of uh, the character and, and everyone really. Heather, uh, I mean, uh, and, and Vicky, you are incredibly funny. You, you yes. hit the nail on the head. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I feel for you and I, I, I know there is more projects about people with disabilities and, and it's coming out. I mean, disabilities, uh, people with down syndrome and you name it, it's, it's coming out. So it's just, it's just people who are creating and putting it out there um, for, and, and for actors with this disabilities too. I mean, that's, that's uh, I know with SAG, people are fighting more for that and in the business. But I do want to say also um, I mean, I, I don't know if you watched Atypical. Um, I mean, no. the first season. I'm just going to ask. Oh, so, yeah. Well, the first season, well, I, I watched part, most of the first season. My, my sister mm -hmm. really loves the show. And mm -hmm. um, there were some critics because there weren't the, there weren't actors with disabilities in, in the first season. And so the great thing is the showrunners, the showrunner, the producers, the, the second season that brought more people mm -hmm. with disabilities, the the storylines, and then uh, and then they got more they 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 uh, you know, got good reviews, and then the third season got better. So it's all this feedback going back and forth between between the public and whoever's creating the project. So it's it's a good it's a good. I mean, I first show that I watched atypical that that really honed in well not just you know the person who has, who has autism but but the family mm -hmm. the, the parents and 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 the the the, the relationships yeah which i always i harp on the relationships and that and then in this movie um thank you petra is really great it read for me it read fast it was just like yeah. read fast really got the characters um got the relationships got the conflicts um, and didn't see that one with Carl, um, you know, you know, coming, but, but it was, it was a great conflict. Uh, I can't, well, stay, I can't I stay on too long, but <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, this was a great script to bring up and I'm, um, you know, looking forward to reading the scripts that, that really uh, push the envelope mm -hmm. and, you know, like everything, everywhere, all at once was just something that really opened up people's eyes to yeah. just, you know, like someone who's been trying to get back in the business for 30 years. And I'm so 
so happy, so happy for him. And so I know I'm running on, but for people with disabilities, people, mm -hmm. I see what's so great, what's so great with, with uh, like my, my, uh, my cousin is, is, uh, has Down syndrome and, and uh, he like 14 and he was in a play and, um, you know, uh, and I see more, you know, what you focus on expands. And so mm -hmm. I see commercials with people with Down syndrome and, 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 and of course the winner of, uh, what's it, the, the, that short film, what's his name? Um, he won at the office, the Irish guy, remember? Oh, great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it was his birthday and everybody sang happy birthday to him, you know? Awesome. So, so yeah, this thing with, 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 uh, you know, just using Down syndrome as an example, but you mm -hmm. know, that spectrum, you know, I have a lot of, I have some close friends and, and they're, you know, they're on the spectrum, but um, I just wanted to chime in and just, you know, I can't stay too long, but, but I'm really happy that you guys, you really, you brought this script, that's right, thank you. And, thank um, you. <laughs> um, and it really opens up the conversation more. Yeah. I also uh, humanity, love humanity, you know, humanity. Yes. Well, trust me, Roger, I would love to be able to get more jobs that help move the representation forward. And I have tried to get an agent, but you know how hard that is to actually say, I'm an actor with a disability, please be my agent. Agents don't changing, respond to that very well. I don't know if you know this, but there's a new group called Ability, Ability E that you can join for, I think I think it's I don't know if it's just voice actors, but you can join it. I just, I got in and I was like, Sweet. well, can you send me the info Sure, like, on Facebook or whatever? Yeah. and Because I want if, to. If you're able to find that uh, info, Erin, if you could also maybe put it in a comment below this video or you yeah. can give to me, I'll put it in the, the description. So that'd be great. Um, so from like Rox and Vicky, I have a question because this is like a lot of the time, even if it's not something that you've seen before, you're familiar with like the genre, you've heard about the movie, the show, the whatever it is we're talking about. This is one of those things that was entirely new. I don't know if any, like when you guys, um, how many people like when we're doing these and stuff like that, read the scripts before we go in, how many people wait until we're here? This one, I read about half of it. I read a okay. little bit so I could see if I, my neurotypical self could actually portray a character with, or a neurodivergent self could actually portray a neurodivergent character because I wasn't sure if I could to be very it was, honest. I think it was very realistically written having like personal experience with that in my own life and um like family members and stuff like that that are on the spectrum and I'm like I see these little moments of like yeah I have a cousin that does that yeah I know this person that their lens I guess for the for the world is very tinged with like it, it just felt like I was like it, half of at least at half the script. I was like, wow, I feel like I'm having a conversation with somebody. But OK, so for not having read the script or if you did um, having like a script that nobody has seen before. Like, what are your thoughts? Like you can if nothing, if you're not familiar with what the blacklist is, the blacklist is like the most liked, most talked about. Um, unpublished scripts of a year that people like you know they really like the story or whatever and it's like I can totally see why this made number three on the slot for last year and I was like just reading through it I was I'm hoping still that this gets made but you know for you know like Rox and, and Vicky like and Aaron you know what are your what are your guys thoughts on like a script that you hadn't seen done before that you're basing like your characterization strictly on the script I it interesting because I read the script halfway, but then I got like enough of the tropes to know where it was going. Like, okay, mm -hmm. it's a college. This is the high guy. This is the RA. Like, I don't need to know mm -hmm. the whole story to like be these characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I could just enjoy it as it was unfolding. Yeah. Because what this was interesting to me is that it's a very musical script mm -hmm. and we can't hear any of that music. <laughs> no. Actually, I, um, Thank you. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Erin. No, um, please do I, I, uh, I read half the script like 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 you did, and I got yeah. the you know the tropes and stuff like that. And I'm a big music person. I mean, I play music, I sing, mm -hmm. all that. So uh, when it came to those part those times, I would I had my iPhone and I would use my Apple 
You yeah. made a playlist. You listened and, to it. Yeah, yeah. I would play, um, I would play the music, and a lot of it, uh, you know, because it's it's all about the tone. Also, you, it's not obviously, you know, you have a disabled, you it, the the um, the the autism factor is huge, right? But there's just so many other themes too, you know, that you you can't ignore, yeah. Um, like the relationships, but the music adds a lot. So listening to it, like I mean, if I put my producer hat on, I put my producer yes. hat, <laughs> uh, I it reminded me a lot of not. It reminded me a little bit of like. I don't know if you watch Rushmore, like mm -hmm. a like a Wes Anderson. Anderson, type yeah. You know, it was like Wes Anderson meets um, like atypical kind of tone. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking there's a lot of days comedy of in it too, which which is great. Five Hundred Days of Summer, ex yeah, excellent example. Yeah, Vicky, 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 like Vicky Norris in that playlist that wasn't quite right. It's just the the music girl. definitely informs a lot. Like I would the the soundtrack for this is like almost any other indie film where it's just like it's it's a love letter to a state of mind I think which is a very cool thing to have in like a soundtrack it's like some of them it's just a score which can also be very cool some of it is like it's very poppy and that's fine if that's what they're going for and then you have like the more indie ones like the soundtrack for Juno, the soundtrack I think for this would be very similar to just like, it's more about you're getting into like the character state of mind. And I think right. that's yeah. very, yeah, it's, it's it evokes like almost an emotional connection to what you're watching as much as what you're watching creates like a visual connection. It's you so know, funny you I... mentioned Juno, cause I was, I was thinking like Rushmore slash Juno kind of yeah. vibe with the feel, with the music, with the mm -hmm. characters and, you know that stuff or and and also i mean not that it's connected to is like this remind me of like star lord in guardians of galaxy but, yeah know, like, no absolutely like, it's okay. absolutely awesome i, had, I thought about that too yeah especially since it's from his mom yes heather go ahead um you know i was just thinking about the relationship that ben had with carl and his friends it was conditional as long as ben did what they wanted and was what they wanted everything was fine but as soon as ben made a mistake a neurodivergent mistake carl was like oh my god this freak of nature is trying to be one of us and he's not one of us and we're never going to accept him let's shun and run uh okay Basically, I didn't that's what that. it is yeah. and it's like neurodivergent individuals try to fit in with neurotypical individuals yeah. every day but as soon as they make a social mistake like, I know punching is extreme, but it's like a metaphor. It's like as soon as neurodivergent individuals make a social mistake, the neurotypical individuals shun and run. And it's like, there's no forgiveness. There's no possibility for, given, for forgiveness. The label uh, as a freak is slapped on the neurodivergent's face that forever. And there's no possibility for forgiveness, redemption. There's just the label of a freak, a monster. A okay, but also, that's also a very extreme. Ahem. There's it. No, it's not because I lived that exact same way in my 20s and in my 30s. Like I was associated with people who were cool with me as long as I behaved in the way they wanted me to be. And I wasn't myself. I painted myself in a way that they wanted me to be and present. But as soon as I started having my own thoughts, they stopped talking to me. I don't I don't talk to a lot of people I associated with in my I mean, 20s anymore. Can I just I interject? For a second, yeah, okay. yeah. I I um, have neurodivergent friends. One of my best friends got a neurodivergent child. I have experience um, from an outsider viewpoint. Reading this script, though, I didn't read. I didn't see what you did, Heather. And I think that that's part of your um viewing from your personal experience and not specifically what's on the page right and i, I think I that we all do that with all the scripts that we read everybody yeah. comes from their own viewpoints but i certainly didn't feel that they called him a monster they included him in all their parties they asked him to come over um 
it's yeah. It's, so and but he it, made it, a mistake. There was no grace for forgiveness. Well, well, that's not necessarily true either. Because okay, two things: one personal and one strictly to do with the script. One, like. I'm a weird girl. I'm aware of this. I am okay with that fact. But for a long time, people were not okay with me being weird. And it's not necessarily only neuroatypical understands this, only neurotypical would not. It doesn't really matter. You can just be the person that no one understands. You can be the person who someone just doesn't get along with. That you just, you need to find somebody who's on your groove, who's on your wavelength. And that does include people not thinking that you're okay or like you go along with certain things until you don't, until you do something that they, you know, dislike or call you out on or whatever. And sometimes you can move past it and sometimes you can't. My thought as far as the script was they were kind of like, you know, yes, he's weird and they were probably, he was a little bit more like team mascot necessarily, not like a, a member of the group. They were like, performative oh, friends. They treated him like he was a project instead of an actual friend. Is that what you're saying? Because that's what I saw. Well, and it's not that they weren't doing that, thing. but People I do think projects. they genuinely, but I do think they genuinely cared at least to like as much as they are capable. I mean, Carl is effectively a dude bro and that's fine, but he still had genuine, he's like, oh, if we're going to do this, oh dude, I can totally help you get her. Should he have said what he wanted yes he should have should Carl have not gone down that but that was him and Emma's decision it really only stopped being okay when it went to an extreme which was Ben punching him in the face over a unstated thing yes just because you knew that he liked her doesn't mean that she knew or cared or was flirting in the first place or would have been okay with it going farther. It's like, you never put yourself out there to say, yes, I wanted this. No, I didn't. Whatever. Um, it yes, wasn't Carl until started it by actually kissing her when he knew that that was the boundary. Well, we don't know who started it. We just see them kissing at the party. My point is at that, when they stop being okay with him, it's not that he stopped doing what they wanted. It was that he punched someone over an extreme and, and granted it's and an he extreme apologized story, it's an extreme. and they should understand that it well, took a lot for him to but apologize. also when you do something that extreme no matter what your stance in the group is people are sometimes not okay with that and they do eventually come around but it's like they weren't comfortable with someone who is potentially going to fly off the handle i'm not saying that's his reaction to everything but that was an extreme reaction that he put in a social situation, which is at least partially of his own making because he did not tell Emma how he felt and he let his emotions get away with him. He let his misunderstanding of the situation carry into a very extreme physical act and they kind of need it. They're like, dude, okay, we're not comfortable. I mean, Emma is very much no nonsense. It's actually why I thought Roxanne would be a great character, you know, to read for her because it says right in the script, she is a no-nonsense type of girl. This is a girl who has no shame, and this is a girl because she feels shame is not needed, and this is a girl who knows what she's about. And I'm like, I love her character. I think she's really cool. But she puts her foot down. She's like, first of all, you're talking about me like I'm not 30 feet away listening to every word you're saying. And two, you did something that was not cool. You never told me you liked me. You punched him in the face, and we're not okay being around you right now because we don't know what you're going to do next. And so the cut making a little bit later, but cut to a little bit later, and they're both capable of having a conversation. They're having a, t a talk at the party. So was it's the not we can never be her. friends again. I well, I did no. want to say for the oh, yeah. from a neuro like typical standpoint, if anyone neurotypical or neurodivergent divergent like punches you in the face. You have the right to say, I don't ever want to deal with that person again. Yeah. If neurodivergent, I mean, neurotypical and neurotypical, if someone punches me in the face, I might not ever <laughs> talk to them again. I want to be around them or whatever. And Absolutely. that's fine. If I would choose or any individual would choose to forgive them, they could forgive them and still not be around them, or they could forgive yeah. them and be around them. And that's up to them. So that's all I wanted to say is that but here's the thing I'd buy that if Emma totally wasn't into making out with Ben before if she wasn't, wasn't into him in. they were making out at parties before so if she wasn't into him why did she do that in the first place that was like playing a game with them and the they made out at said, one uh, party when they were intoxicated which they point out but and she was playing again. with him she was she was leading him on and making believe oh she was into him that's crap 
I think that she may not be the line. difference between flirting or not. Yeah, well, but she, she put the thought into his mind, oh, I like you back. All right, can I can I get here for a second? Hold on, Roger, go ahead. All right, from a from a screenwriter, uh, from a creative screenwriter point of view, mm. you know you know how like uh, there's reality, and you all know this, and there's dramatizing mm -hmm. what's reality, yeah. like a real book, like a book is never going to be dramatized in the screenplay exactly like the book. Never, ever, ever, ever. Everything's always, you know, juxtaposed this and that. <clears throat> Personally, I read it like like you, Petra, and, and, and you, Roxane, uh, that, that it was set up, the set up with meeting Carl and Emma and everyone was perfect. It was perfect because they took him in. I mean, they knew he was quote unquote, this and that and this, and they still took him in because, you know, because dramatically it's a great setup for what's gonna happen later where the, 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 it just falls off the cliff from a dramatic point of view. Now we can hear, sit here and, and, um, and argue and, or, or, you know, go back and forth with, well, he should have done that and they should have done that and blah, 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 blah. But we're all different. We all come from different points of view, especially you, Heather, because you're, you live this, you live this life every day of your life since you were born. Yes, I agree. And, and we, respect, we respect that. We respect your feelings and how you feel, but we all come from different walks of life, from different experiences and, and, it's okay. I always say I'm on different groups in, in sports groups, and I tell people it's okay to agree to disagree. I mean, it's totally okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, we, I we cheer we, we cheer for the same team, like right, yeah. but we argue within the group yeah. because oh, they should have played that player instead of fine. You know, that's okay. I, I apologize we're cheering, for getting We're bad. cheering for the same no, team. No, 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 no. We're not, we're not, this isn't an apology I, thing. It's okay. No, no, no. Yeah, I just would like, I just want to say that um, we're arguing about these people like they're real people, which is a mm -hmm. testament to the goodness of the script. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I, But I would agree with you, Heather. I do think she let him on, and I do think they were treating him like a mascot. Like they knew yeah. his quirks and then they treated him like a project and put him in a position where they knew his buttons would be pushed and then they just set him up to be in a situation where he'd react so strongly that they would have an excuse to ostracize him. Now that would say a lie. I, I do believe they treated him like a project, but I do believe they had good intentions. And well, then it's never good intention when a person know. is treated like a problem or a project rather than a person to be loved. There's never anything good about that. Okay, well, nine thousand wrong. You say that, that it's like a the makeover. You're... There's, yeah, I'm not saying those aren't problematic in their own way, but it's like, I think in their way they were trying. It doesn't make it good or bad, but they're it's like young Carl, and uneducated. Yeah, and on top of that, the thing about Emma's character that I did kind of identify with is she's just very. She's very flirty and affectionate and open and like, you know, she's, she's absolutely the type of person that would like, I mean, she, you see it like four times in the script. She just leans over and gives somebody a peck on the cheek or throws her arms around them. And it's like, these are not people she's dating or romantically interested in. I'm an incredibly affectionate person. And I've had people take that mm -hmm. out of context or, or misunderstand where I'm coming from or what I'm trying to convey when I'm like, you know, when I give them a hug or when I ask them about their day and stuff, it's like, it doesn't mean I'm flirting. I'm not saying it. And it's like, yeah. And I mean, she brings up the fact that she was drunk when they made out. They never made out after that. She's just an affectionate person. When they were sober, she's affectionate the same way she is with everyone else in the friend group. I didn't see anything necessarily about leading it on. And she did give him like openings to say, Hey, I like you. And we just see that they're that I think that's also why they make a point of showing even when they're on the break and he's like, can I text you? And she's like, we're kind of at the point you don't really need to ask, but okay. They make a point of showing you the text. It says it's not a terribly engaging conversation. He has I mean, more I mean, of a connection like, with someone else. People like us are never really good at getting social cues. 
And I understand that too. It's a combination of this is a person who acts in a slightly unusual way from what they're expecting maybe. And that does lead them to think, okay, this means more. They're reading more into it. They're already not the greatest at reading social cues because most people on the spectrum are not. And them having to understand, it's like being straightforward, being direct. And that goes both ways. Ben should have opened up his mouth and said something. Emma should have opened up her mouth and said something. But when you don't look at things through that perspective, you assume most people think like you. And I think this is a common, this is a common problem. We assume other people understand where we're coming from and how we're perceiving things and what we're saying and what we mean when we say this, even if it's not what we're actually saying. It reminds me of people saying, oh, now that I know your reality, I'll try to adapt to be what you need. And they actually don't understand it enough to adapt to what. But again, you could tell them what it is you need or try and find common ground in the middle. They move a little towards the left. You move a little towards the right and you meet in the middle. And that's what you shoot for. Well, sometimes we can't. We can't live up to the expectations that people place on us because simply we can't. That's our brains can't do that. Talk anybody else's expectations. Be yourself, but explain that you are what you are and that people are going to perceive you as they perceive you. If you want to change that, tell somebody who you are. And they can accept it. We can't. We really can't. We sometimes we can't communicate what our disabilities are, though. I personally can't. Yeah. Okay. And, and or if you're in my case, you did not know that you thought different until you were well into your forties, and you're like, "What's so true?" Fuck? But we can't verbally describe who we are. We sometimes have to show it, and it's sometimes showing it sometimes has disaster consequences. And Roxanne has been waiting so patiently, and she looks a little frustrated. So oh, go ahead. And you're muted. I actually, yeah, I just wanted to actually go back to the question that Petra actually asked, which was what it was like to read a script that wasn't a produced work and i think that it definitely gave a little more freedom i think when we read produced works we feel like this subconscious need to do right by this by the produced work or emulate it in some way but reading something that uh is not a produced work then it was very much open to the interpretation of what i felt like emma might be um, but just also a little funny fact is that I didn't know what the blacklist lit was, but I do know what the blacklist TV show is. And I was reading this script right? going, where does this fit in the whole series? Like I just don't, it took me, you know, it was a little bit in and I'm like, okay, yeah, this is just totally something different as nothing to do with the blacklist. Anyways, that was it. Awesome. That's yeah, no, you're good. <laughs> and if yeah, and if that's your frame of reference, I completely understand. Like, uh-huh. we had so many people <laughs> commenting about that when I was. I was like, oh my gosh, I love the blacklist, and they're like, you like the show? I'm like, no, 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 blacklist scripts. They're like, so scripts from the show? No, 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 blacklist means this. And they're like, oh, okay. But I did, yeah, okay. Vicky, how did you feel about playing the professor? Because I, I, I got about halfway through, and I was. It was a strong way in between you and Roger. I was like, because I knew Roger would like really get that whole, you know, bucking the boundaries, bucking the establishment type of vibe. But there were a few moments where I was just like, oh my God, I just picture Vicky with like whiskey and a teacup just doing this. And I just, I had, it was so good. So um, what were your what were your thoughts on the character? How did you like him? I really enjoyed <laughs> Professor Palmer. I really did enjoy being him. Um <laughs> He was a good character. I liked him a lot. My -hmm. time wasn't good, and I only got three pages read. So really, this was a cold read for me, which I really enjoy. Um, And for many decades playing a live theater, um, even well-known plays, I refused (laughs) to be educated on how it was played by whoever. I wanted it to be my interpretation. So I've always, uh, <laughs> I've always had a lot of good luck with that. And uh, so, yeah, that happened tonight. It was, it was like, Hey, I see this guy. I see where this is going. And, and it was immediate. And I really enjoyed being him. And I can see Roger playing <laughs> Professor Palmer too. So. 
I love uh, Vicky. You were just, and you you definitely got it, especially for only reading three pages. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, reading cold copy. <laughs> I know. And um, but it also reminded me of a. Uh, I was just thinking of different actors and 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 Paul Giamatti. Just remind me of Paul Giamatti. Uh, oh, by the way, he, he plays a professor in in uh, Alexander Payne's new movie, The Holdovers. He's a curmudgeon kind of. <laughs> oh, and I wanted to say. I, I really loved your. I just wanted to say the yesterday I saw, I saw somebody on uh, Kelly and Ryan promoting a movie that's about to be released. It was really cool to see Dennis Quaid promoting the movie that I know <laughs> you're in. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very my, exciting. Like, in my head, I cast Palmer as uh, Chris O'Dowd. <laughs> and yeah, something, I could have seen that. Something I said to my husband, I said, hey, I'm Facebook friends with Roger, but hey, more so if someone says to Roger, do you know Vicky? He can actually say, yes, I do. <laughs> I know Vicky. Very cool. Yeah. I know Vicky, guys. <laughs> I just saw way, an advertisement and I just had the light bulb when Vicky said it. I saw the accident. Yeah, <laughs> um, I do. I put in the link uh, for you, Heather, or anyone. Uh, KMR, which is one of the biggest agencies in the country, okay, has a link for um, hiring disabled actors. There's also a link for an agency I found in Canada. For those, for those of you who are Canadian. Well, I'm actually dual citizen, but thanks. Wink, wink. Um, yeah, so so there is a growing, I got to tell you, there is a growing need for disabled actors for, you know, obviously people of color and, and inclusion and all that diversity, all yeah. that, all that stuff is, is just, it's like light years from, I don't know if you remember the olden days where, where on TV it was only like, you know, just this and that. I'm not gonna even say it. But that, you know, I'm I'm really grateful for for all these people and and for disabled disabled actors and actresses, mm -hmm. and, you know. So and anybody in a niche. So I'm also um, now in a voiceover group for queer voice artists. Oh, that is awesome. Hmm. So that, that I just thought you said make. clear, and I'm like, what, transparent what, what is that clear person? We're, we're like transparent. You know, now. we've we've filled out all the paperwork, and we can I'm go clear. in the clear line when we board the plane. I don't know if you've seen those. They yeah. work in the dark so long they become transparent. Albino. We're cave people. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's getting cool. Yeah. It's getting <laughs> <laughs> I saw to to bring it back to this story. I saw an episode of the show The Wilds, which apparently mm -hmm. wasn't very popular and it got canceled, but I loved yeah. it. There was a show episode of The Wilds where it was two neurodivergent people like having a little college romance, and it reminded me a lot of this script without the music though. Yeah, it was just one episode though. Hey, one episode can lead to other work. Yes. Yeah, and you saw it, and you liked it, and you remembered it. So that's yeah, great. it was like a backstory about the one of the characters who is also not neurodivergent. I think, um, the and you no know one else I love that I just yellow jackets <laughs> blasting it out in case anybody hasn't seen it. Love on the Spectrum on Netflix is adorable. I haven't. I see myself in it, Heather. <laughs> watch when you have chance i know you're super duper 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 busy and there's a lot of choices but watch that one and then watch atypical and let us know what you think of those yeah like what yeah maybe from, from your perspective the representation factor like what do you what do you feel yeah where, where's the where's the needle has it moved appropriately yeah. mm -hmm. actually I, I i auditioned for atypical first season um when i was in la for a doctor and um they picked a black woman. Um, How dare they? I know. <laughs> but I really, I it really um, opened my eyes to the whole, you know, spectrum and um, 
in this character and the family. And it was wonderful. And it was my sister who who told me about it. Um, but it, but like I said, the producers really improved on the second and the third season with hiring more people with disabilities and this and that. And the reviews have come out a lot better. So I I definitely recommend a typical. Um, is it on Netflix? I think. Yeah. 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 Netflix yeah. is original. I'll I have a friend that produced a independent film that has a lot of cool VFX and, and stuff. So I'll give a shout out to that uh, called Nathan's Kingdom, where they do have someone neurodivergent. Um, the stories around that and him and the relationship of him and his sister. And they also got a neurodivergent actor to play that role as oh, well. Cool. So, I would love cool. to be able to do things like that. You will. You can. There's an agency I put the link in. Yes. Yeah, I copied all that. All I copied them all that. first thing in the morning. Good. <laughs> I'm awesome. putting a Thank link you. for the my trailer. All right. It'll, it'll I just open. literally am finishing a semester, and then I'm free to do whatever. I Ooh. also heard it. It didn't go over my head that you're going back to LA, Roger. Um, I will be working. Uh, we will be actually. I'm going to LA. Um, in a couple of weeks because I have a couple of meetings with a couple of agents, uh, an actress uh, is referring me. And um, I'm nice. trying to get, because right now, because of pandemic, everything's like, you can audition from anywhere. You just have to work as a local hire. So I have I have friends who, a zillion friends in LA, because I lived there for a few years, who, who I could use their addresses. And as long as I fly myself and put myself put myself up. Um, so between New York, that's why I'm doing the triangle, New York, Atlanta, LA. Um, so you can work from any, I mean, you can be submitted from anywhere. You, I mean, you all know this, uh, but yeah, to answer your question, yeah, I, I miss LA. I miss, I miss the, the weather a lot. Well, lately, <laughs> not right now. It's not good exactly. now. Oh, not right yeah. now. No, it's, it's been raining constantly this year. Yeah, it never so rained in Southern California. It would be so. It would be no. so nice to work in California again. The last time I did it was two thousand four. When it rained when I was there, the rain never reached the ground. It was so hot. Oh wow! Yeah. Often, it, often it only rains like at night and a maximum of like two weeks out of the whole entire year. Like, of course, there's certain days it rains, but the majority of the time, but like now it's raining for, it feels like months straight, even though there's been gaps in between. I I, yeah. I, I didn't know if it, it, it's still raining. I thought it stopped for a little while. Today and yesterday it stopped. Yeah. <laughs> Supposed to rain again tomorrow. Oh, okay. I never look, I still don't look at the weather. Because where do you, when you, where do you live, here, Jacob? Where do you uh, live, Jacob? LA, I'm in Burbank right now, but grew up near San oh, Burbank. Diego. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so if you need an any address. other any other Los Angelinos here? Nice. Aaron. Oh, so Aaron. Okay. Maybe when you come, we'll do a little Disney trip if you have the time. Aaron. Okay. Roger, whoever's around here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have to. We have. We definitely have to have like a, a physical gathering. Okay. And like a yeah. physical reading. Around I've never team. been to Disneyland. Ever. Yeah. Well, come on down. Just throwing that out there. Down. Come, come on down. No. Like it's the price is right. Anybody, Heather, Vicky, Petra, you guys. You know, it here? would be great to go to Disneyland again. I went in 2004, performed in the park with my musical group. Really? That's cool. Yes, I did. But yeah, like Roger said, when we have a, okay. a group here, we'll get together in person. When we have a group in Canada, we'll try and get together in person. So. There you go. I have a friend who works Disney, we could get free tickets. She has like a, she works for Disney. And oh, that so we could, does. We could get in. Your friend and sponsor, Jacob. Okay. <laughs> cool. We have another connection here as well. So, but cool. Gotta run. It's past midnight okay. here. Night. Yes, go to bed. Yes, what are, job, what are we doing? Great what job. Are we doing next week. Up by next week. Good. I believe that's the Star Trek, Trek one, right? Let's see. Anybody have it up? 
Well, thank you. Thank you. Checking so on our <laughs> pinned post in the Table Read Tuesday Facebook group and the 2023 schedule for next week. Yes, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. <laughs> that sounds lovely. Man, you're going to get starring roles, lead roles, two weeks in a row, Heather? <laughs> <laughs> Technically three if you count Carter. I mean that was a pretty meaty role. Yeah, wow. You ran like you ran last year's feather. last week's ER, so Oh yeah. She's just getting it all. Well, I already <laughs> sent my team friend. I mean we know. Okay. This, um, uh any I, final thoughts on the movie, the scripts? April 2nd coming up is World Autism Awareness Day. And oh, yes. for the month of April to wear blue. I forgot about, I mean, I knew that was coming. I forgot, but I forgot about the blue thing. Otherwise I said, hey, everybody, we're blue tonight. She did wear blue, look at her sweater. I personally think we should get more than just a day or more than just a week. We should have it all year round and we should be not just accepted, but loved unconditionally by all. Everyone should be as much as possible. And that's okay. true of all people everywhere. Yes. Especially us, because we're needy and we need that affection to blossom and to grow. Actors, actors need it. Exactly. And I think I should. I think we should all be hired. You know, because diversity matters. And because all aspects all of skilled, diversity matter. You guys are, everyone here is skilled. That's why you should also be that hired. too. Yes. We are brimming over with talent, people. Hire us, please. <laughs> yes, please. And represent represent me. I need representation, please, so I can get the good job. Call, call the agent the he morning. told you about. Write it down. Go. <laughs> no, right. Call him. I must yep. I think this is say a good time farewell. Yeah, good so, night, Rock. Um, good night, good night. Bye, guys. Great acting. Um, great conversation, I think. Healthy Definitely. conversation for us to see the different point of views and like that it was brought out, like how much these characters evoked a reaction from us so again props to the writer like even more so than a lot of like the produced scripts and stuff i don't even know why i can't exactly pinpoint it but i got a kick out of the script and i really i could visualize this one even more i like the in the, the characters and their stuff so yeah um thank you petra for that um any final thoughts before we go um, mm -hmm. Autistic people are not monsters. We're not projects. We're people who deserve to be loved. And on that, okay. we agree. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.